three, two, something like that. Welcome to the very informal Lovecraft Easing podcast. Um, It's November 2021. This year just flew by. Anyway, today got a lot of people here. We've we've got uh, Philip Gillott and and Morgan uh, King, right? That's correct. Yeah. And um, we've got Philip Fricassi, because you can never have too many Phillips on a show. And we've got Kelly Young. Uh, Kelly Young and Philip Fricassi are going to talk about a new book of Phillips that Strange Eons, meaning Kelly, published. It's called Commodore. I just got it in the mail. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, and it's just now available in Kindle and paperback. Is that correct kelly that is correct as of this weekend it is now available on amazon in paperback and kindle all right the things that we talk about tonight um i do have those links in the show notes and um if you're listening later to the audio edition there i'll i always include them there as well um but right now on youtube if you're like oh, i gotta get this commodore book then you can you don't have to search for it. You can just go down there and click. And same thing with watching uh, uh, The Spine of Night. So anyway, um, Philip Fricassi has to be um, somewhere else in about an hour, right, Philip? Yeah. So uh, Philip Gillott and Morgan were just fine with letting you and Kelly talk about Commodore for a few minutes. And then, you know, you can take off and we can spend the rest of the time talking about their new film the spine of night so, yeah i'm gonna try and stick around for some of that too because i saw it last night and it was awesome oh, oh thanks. great yeah oh, yeah it was a it was a gummy pleasure <laughs> that <was>. awesome <laughs> i've never heard that turn of phrase before but i, I will assume it. i will assume that is good it was a sugar <laughs> high mike what's that it was a sugar high it was huh? i think lucy lawless said in an article when she was interviewed that you should light up before you watch this movie. So, so anyway, let's do introductions from my panelists and then go on to the guests. So, Rich, why don't we start with you, buddy? Hi, I'm uh, Rich. I'm a Patreon and just longtime uh, friend of the podcast. Matthew Carpenter. Hello there. I'm Matt. I help run the Easy Movie Night. We are going to be finishing uh, the series Chapel Wait next weekend. And the weekend after that, we'll be back to be showing uh, feature films. Uh, if you want to participate, you have to simply download the app cast. Go find the, quote, party, easy movie night and ask to join. It'll be accepted and you can get them on the phone. Yeah, along that note, on that note, um, if you go to, to the Lovecraft Easing website, lovecrafteasing.com, uh, one of the first uh, articles at the very top will be uh, I forget what I named it, but basically Lovecraft easing events. So for example, Sunday night that w- we do this just about every Sunday, Tuesday night at nine Eastern, we do old time radio live. You know, we listen to it and, you know, f- whoever's in there with us can comment on it and everything. It's a lot of fun. Uh, old time radio horror for the most part. Um, and then, you know, Thursday nights for is for Patreons. We either do a Patreon-only podcast or for the Patreons at the $10 level and up, we do, um, you know, just hanging out, not recorded, uh, nothing like that, just uh, hanging out with the panelists. So that's a lot of fun. Um, so, and then, of course, as Matt just mentioned, Saturday nights um, is movie night. So you can... You can get the skinny on all those and the times and everything if you go to lovecrafteasing.com. It's right right up there. Now here, before I, before I continue with introductions, here is where uh, Matt would usually announce the prize. However, uh, I have permission from both parties to, to give away a prize. Um, we've got two new books uh, to talk about. Uh, one of them, of course, is Commodore uh, by Philip Fricassi, published by Strange Eons. And uh, Kelly's going to uh, give one of those away to a lucky, yes, there it is, to a lucky listener. And um, then Scott 
Thomas's new book, uh, The Veil of the White Horse, is now available. And it's available in Kindle and in print, um, as is Commodore. Um, and uh, it's act that one's actually available. Uh, Veil of the White Horse is available on Kindle Unlimited. So um, we're going to give away one copy uh, each of those books. So, you know, um, Scott Thomas belongs in that same uh, type of writers as um, Charles Grant, Ray Bradbury, Kevin Lucia, I feel, you know, that quiet horror, moody. Um, Charles could, Grant could write about a leaf blowing down the street and, and keep you mesmerized. So um, it, if you haven't read Scott Thomas, here's a great way to start. And I can certainly recommend others to you. Uh, I published The Sea of Ash several years ago. And, um, and uh, I, I, yeah, help me out here, Kelly, because I'm not saying this because I published it. It's a, it's a very, very good book. It's one of my favorite books, hands down. The Sea of Ash is one of my favorite all-time books. That's good to hear. Great. Scott, I love hearing that. Uh, so anyway, to continue with introductions, uh, let's go on to Rick. Rick Lay, writer and pulp magazine collector. All right, Bridget. Hello, Bridget, composer, artist. We just did a Patreon podcast with Bridget a little while ago. So that's, that's available. Talking about movie soundtracks. And you listed your uh, some of your favorites. I've yes. There, so. so, yeah. Uh, Pete Rollick. Pete Rollick, Mike's all to go around slave. And, mm. uh, dog's body, I guess. <laughs> all right. Let's start. Um, let's do the other introductions. Let's start with Philip Fricasi. Uh, Philip Fricasi, uh, I'm a horror, horror writer. Okay. What about you, Kelly? You want to introduce yourself? Uh, Kelly Young, publisher, podcaster, first time caller, long time listener. <laughs> but you love the show, right? I do love the show. That, that's good to hear, especially from you. We, we've always been each other's greatest nemesis. nemesis what's, what's the plural on that? Uh, all right. Uh, Morgan, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Morgan King. I'm the co-director and lead animator for The Spine of Night. And last but not least, Philip Gillette. Uh Hi, I'm Phil Gillette. I am a screenwriter and uh, director, co-directed The Spine of Night with Morgan, uh, made the Laird Baron adaptation They Remain, and have written various other things that you may or may not have seen. <laughs> Happy to be here. Also a long-time listener. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Phil is a uh, is a patron. Indeed, I am. Yeah, yeah, and I really appreciate that. So, you know, if you're listening and you're not a patron, be like be like Phil. <laughs> so, I, I'm a patron too, Mike. I just want to make sure that we're be like be like both spread, Phils. We're spreading it around. Be like both Phils. <laughs> that's right. You are. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, you got a picture of Jalot behind you, my favorite <laughs> patron. You're like, oh, that's right, Philip. You were. Patron. I totally forgot. That's, that's All right, favorite. both. Let me back up. Both Phillips are patrons. So if you want to be as cool as both of these Phillips, anyway, yeah, I appreciate you guys. Um, some more cool people like Victor Laval is is a patron, and it just blows me away. I appreciate the support, really. Um, and you can be a patron and get all access to all the. Um, um, patreon podcasts some really cool stuff for as little as five bucks a month you know so and a cup of coffee basically so why don't we start with um talking about commodore with philip and and kelly so you know however you guys want to start um how did this what was the genesis of this book whichever the two of you want to answer what was the genesis of Strange Eons publishing it. Well, uh, I think Philip knows that he is one of my favorite writers and has been since I read Alter several years ago. And I, I've been telling him that I, I really want to publish something of yours. And he had been saying 
let's make it happen. And then I guess it was just as the pandemic was starting to hit, he called me up and said, I got this story that I think you're going to like. And, uh, and I read it and I loved it. And we kind of hashed out the details. I, I had kind of a vision of, uh, of making it an illustrated novella similar to Stephen King's Cycle of the Werewolf. And we just started throwing ideas at each other on, on how it would all come out. And I hope Philip is as proud of it as I am. I think it turned out beautifully. It yeah, did. Uh, it looks great. Yeah, I'm, I haven't seen the paperback, but I've, but a couple of the uh, people who have bought the paperback uh, are have talked to, said about how brilliant, how, how how nice it looks, how nice the illustrations look, and everything. So, um, yeah. So for me, my, yeah, for my end, exactly. Kelly and I wanted to work together, and so I wrote him a story, and it was supposed to be. I think we originally talked about it being like ten thousand words, and I ended up being about twenty five thousand words or something like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I in the story um, is if anyone who's read um, Beneath the Bell Sky, which is my new collection, one of the stories in there, which was previously published by Mike, actually as part of um, Shiloh, uh, Shiloh's original publication, there was a bonus story in there called Soda Jerk, and Soda Jerk is uh, takes place in this town of Sabbath, fictional town of Sabbath, um, where you know uh, there's sort of an underlying uh, uh, preternatural elements. There's creatures you know hiding in the lakes and the trees and and the townspeople are sort of all in on it and it's sort of like this weird little small town uh circa like 1950s uh you know so sort of Ray Bradbury with a, with a with a Lovecraftian twist maybe and um and in that story uh there's a moment where uh this guy is giving this girl a tour of the town and he tells her about this haunted car uh that's in the junkyard and the the kids always challenge themselves to go find this try and find this haunted car and um, and it's sort of like one of those you know urban legends that you grew up with as a kid, and you're like you know let's go find this thing. But I but so Commodore is so he's alluding to this these kids that went to find it, uh, you know x some years ten years ago, and uh, and how they were never seen again, and uh, and it's only about you know a couple sentences in Soda Jerk. So I flushed that story into a full novella so the the commodore is about what happened to those kids uh, who went to look for that haunted car so it's pretty it's a lot of fun it's it's definitely like a lot of my stuff it's sort of throwback uh, feel it's definitely like um you know kind of like that horror small you know meets small town uh, vibe but um kind of yeah. like a king meets bradbury type thing yeah i would never say that but sure but I'll, i that. would say that as soon as i read it i saw all of the bradbury in it and uh that that really informed the way i wanted the illustrations to go so i i, I asked i asked philip uh what do you think if we uh make the illustrations look like they should be hardy boys covers and uh i and love that, that that got the ball rolling on, on who I would approach for the artist. And the artist is a guy named Brian Vox, who's really a brilliant artist who can do just about anything. But what he's known for is uh, his erotica. But he's also a good friend of mine. And I, I asked him, you know, do you think that you'd be able to do something like this in this style? And I let him read the book. And wouldn't you know it, he's a huge Bradbury fan. And he read it and he was like, oh, my God, I'm totally in on this. So I just I really lucked out with every turn on this. Well, you know how I feel about Bradbury. And yeah. uh, of course, like many of us, I, I love love King. And, you know, I have to say. And this is, I understand this is derivative at all, Philip. Uh, we all have our influences, um, you know, directly or indirectly. But as soon as I saw this cover, I really could not help but think of King, you know, um, for whatever reason. Yeah, it's got that throwback yeah. vibe with the kids. And I thought that, that the typography that Kelly used on the cover for like my name and stuff was it was a nice touch, uh, kind of gave that old 90s you know, early 90s King vibe, which I thought was really cool. And well, yeah, Brian Vox. Early 80s. Park. Huh? Early 80s. That's actually the font that he used in Firestarter. On the oh, paper. really? Oh, is it? Yeah. I yeah. Totally. I'm not as old as Kelly, so I think in different terms, but. Oh, yeah. a few, few of us are. Yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, Vox knocked out of the park. I remember when Kelly sent me uh, the first image and I was like, this is, it was one of those moments where you're like, this is far better than I ever could have imagined it. Um, yeah. And uh, and so I was really, you know, ecstatic. And, and Kelly did a great job totally, uh, you know, the, on, the, on, on his own, 
you know, uh, uh, intention just to kind of like stylize the book and do a lot of things that I uh, hadn't thought to do. And, um, and uh, so it's a really cool, I think it's a really cool, the book itself, as it turned out, is a really neat experience. I think it's kind of a neat multimedia sort of experience in the sense that you got art and you got kind of interesting typography, and then you have this kind of crazy story. So I think it's, uh, I'm, yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty good. Uh, people seem to like it so far. So, you know. Well, um, I just got the book in the mail a few days ago, and my TBR is well, like the rest of us, is very, very high. Um, so I haven't got a chance to read it yet, but I, I have no doubt that it's a worthy endeavor because Kelly published it. He wouldn't publish it otherwise and i also know because i know you philip uh you consistently put out great work uh so when i say it it reminds me of king i don't mean that in a derivative sense but more in the sense of like our friend paul trimbley you know he's not afraid to wear his influences on his sleeve and you know and and say you know yeah that influenced me that would influence me this pop culture thing influenced me but he makes it his own thing so yeah, I think I actually, I, I do actually have a Bradbury epigraph in the beginning of the book. So I yeah, tipping I my hand, that. Tipping my hand there a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Bradbury small stuff. stuff. Charles Grant as well, you know, and um, mm -hmm. uh, for sure, those guys did a great, you know, did a great, great job of creating mal malice in those kind of, uh, you know, idyllic uh, small, you know, atomic communities. And I thought, you know, atomic age communities. And I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a really fun world to explore. And I have a bunch of other Sabbath stories. I mentioned this in this afterward in there and I don't give anything away, but I have a bunch of other Sabbath stories that um, I hope to write. And I've already written a few uh, that have appeared here and there at different places. So I'm trying to uh, really explore that town more and kind of what's going to happen, uh, what's what's happened in the past. And, you know, hopefully one day I'll, I'll get to, you know, how it all ends. But there's a few characters I definitely want to explore. There's a guy who owns a movie theater that shows movies that turns people insane and um, things, different things that happen in Sabbath that are I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, are you trying to slowly build um, a universe that all of your books inhabit? Or are you not worried about that? No, no, I'm not worried about that. I think it's more just like, um, you know, sometimes because, you know, I write a lot of, I, I write a lot of different type of things. I even write in a lot of different styles and I have, been writing kind of more focusing on novels the last couple of years. So I've written three or four novels the last couple of years. And um, so I'm not writing as many short stories as I was maybe five years ago. Um, and I think what's fun about having the Sabbath thing is uh, it kind of gives me a little bit of a place to kind of go home to in a way like, oh, you know, may I'll take like a, you know, a couple of weeks off and from this project and I'm going to go see what's going on going on in Sabbath, you know, kind of thing. And so it's just something more fun for me. Um, I don't play it up really in the stories, um, you know, other than just kind of casually mentioning here and there that it, that's where it's taking place. But, but yeah, I think, and I also like the idea of there just there being this weird town that's, that's sort of like this, got this Twilight Zone disease going on where something weird is always happening. Um, so yeah, yeah so just, kind of, just, more, just more for me, just kind of something, Sometimes you need to entertain yourself as a you know as a writer uh, as well. So um, so you find things that kind of you know make it. Well, somebody said once, um, write the kind of book that you feel is missing or that you would like to read. You know, write that, and that sounds like what you're trying to do here. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that mantra. I think a lot of times, you know, I'm my own. Uh, I mean, I'm my own. I'm my own first reader and. When I'm writing something, if I start getting a little bit um, glassy-eyed, you know, if I start, you know, if I feel the excitement waning, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go a different direction, or I'll take a break and I'll think about, okay, this is going. Not, I want to do something really different because I, I, I want all my stories to have an impact. I don't want them just to be like another story that you kind of read and then forget about five minutes later. So I, I do try when I'm writing. I do try and entertain myself, and if I feel like something's getting a little stagnant. I try and figure out, okay, what can I do that would really be unexpected here, you know, and, and go a completely different direction or turn it on its head a certain way. And that's, that makes it fun for me. And hopefully it makes it fun for, for readers. And I did that, I think in Commodore, even there was a couple of times where I was like, you know what this book needs, it needs a monster dog. You know, <laughs> of course. Uh, before I, I want to ask you a, a, for a spoiler free synopsis, but before I do that, I want to make it clear anybody who has a question or a comment on this, please join in. So uh, 
that said, Philip, can you give us a spoiler-free synopsis of Commodore? Just um, a little bit about yeah. what the book's about. Yeah, so the book's about, um, it's about a group of uh, four young boys who are friends uh, that live in Sabbath. And uh, they decide one day that they're going to go, um, they're going to go, uh, they've decided that after enough talk, we're going to go find this black car, this infamous black car. And um, that's in the, uh, that's in this Riley's junkyard, which is a mammoth city royal sized junkyard where, you know, the kids are always kind of warned not to go, don't go, don't go, don't go in there, don't go in there. So so they decide Which is that, exactly what they're going to do when they're told not to. Of course. So they pedal their bikes <laughs> down the road and they and they go looking for the black car and they this isn't really a spoiler. They find it. And um, and the book is basically about what happens um, once they find the car. And uh, and um, I think it, to go anything further than that would probably be a spoiler. But yeah. that's essentially it. And they do find the car and they do go on a certain adventure of sorts. And um and uh, yeah, and it's and it's very scary. What um, I, I want to remind everybody that I have the link uh, to Commodore and to several other books. Uh, uh, Pete's got a new book out, for example. I just published a new book uh, written by Michael Menace. Uh, he's a very wonderful Lovecraftian writer. He's very underrated. But my point is, as we're talking about Commodore, as we're talking about the Spine of Night, you don't have to go and search for them. You can just look in the show notes and I, you can click right in to buy it. So uh, anybody else want to jump in? I've got a question. Yes. Uh, can, can you, Philip, talk more about the town of the Sabbath, just in terms of like what I'm, I'm fascinated by the creation of fictitious cities like or towns. Like, do you have in your mind, like, how specific is it in your mind? Like, do you have a geography? Do you have like a, a history of the town? Do you have like, what is, um, what's the back matter in your imagination for it? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and it's so good to see my buddy, Phil. I haven't seen him in a long time. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, for sure. Actually, I do have even like, there's a somewhat, you know, there is a somewhat even, you know, geography to it that I've actually kind of written, put down on a piece of paper as it were, um, because there's, Sabbath Lake, and then there's and there's like there's like an adjacent sort of forest which I have which I've named, but I can't remember off the top of my head. And and yeah, so and there's like Main Street, which is where a lot of Soda Jerk takes place. And actually, if you read the book Soda Jerk, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this story Soda Jerk, which is very short, um, it's literally this guy giving a tour to this this girl who just moved there, and and um, uh, you know the high school age, and so he's actually giving her a tour of Sabbath, and they go to a few different places they go to sabbath lake and she doesn't understand why nobody's swimming or fishing and they go to the junkyard and she doesn't understand why he's telling her creepy stories and they go to main street and she doesn't really understand you know why everyone's acting so strange um and why they why they're making her drink a milkshake um so there's definitely uh a lot of backstory and then and i don't think this is giving anything away the general uh the general idea is that there are um uh, the townspeople are basically stewards of these intergalactic creatures who reside hidden in this town. And, mm -hmm. and the stewards are all kind of in on it. And so there's that element of when strangers come to town, um, you know, they're either passing through or they're not leaving kind of thing. So there's that. And uh, so the, uh, and there's like a certain ritual um, it takes place when the townspeople are given this kind of like knowledge um, and understanding, if you will, they're kind of opened up to uh, their consciousness is somewhat expanded. Um, and that's done through a certain ritual. So yeah, so it, that's kind of the underlying idea. And then because these creatures who live there are these intergalactic kind of uh, godlike Lovecraftian-esque uh, type creatures, you know, there's there's like a gateway God and there's, you know, so it's definitely based on some of that mythology um, somewhat loosely. And the idea is that because these creatures all exist there, it causes sort of weirdness to bubble to the surface. Um, yeah. And that weirdness makes cats do weird things like in my story, Marmalade, and it makes cars do weird things like in the Commodore. And so there's this kind of like, you know, like I said, there's a supernatural uh, stuff that happens because there's magic in the soil as it were and in the water 
So that's kind of the idea. And so what I want to expand on is how did they, how did it kind of all start? And then I also want to get into how did it all end, but I first want to explore some key characters of the town and, um, and some of the weird stuff that happens, uh, you know, because. Oh, no, you're not harming any of the cats, are you? No. <laughs> okay. okay Good. Not. Good. <laughs> we, we can continue. So, yeah. No. Uh, anyone else? Question for Kelly and Philip. Doug Haven. Uh, so first, uh, Kelly, you did um, a hardcover, right? Yeah, well, very well, limited yeah. edition hardcover. Limited 77 autographed and numbered, autographed by both Philip and Brian. Right, right. And so now it's on Amazon. Uh, Kindle is 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 very economical priced very well at 399 if i remember right yes so you know if you want to read this story you can click on and you got a kindle you can click on it you could read it tonight after the show so or you can order a, a paperback which will have um this this cover right yes paperback does not have the the dust jacket cover that was exclusive to the 77 uh, but it was really important to both Rick and I, Rick, my partner in Strange Eons, uh, to get the illustrations into the paperback and the ebook. And I got to say, they look spectacular, especially on the ebook where you can, you know, blow everything up and really see some of the detail in there. Yeah, I was going to ask about the illustrations in the ebook. Did they, did it work out all right and everything? Yeah, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, That's and they're great. all full color, you know, which is kind of rare in these types of books. You know, the yeah, the images are full color, and the it's uh, and they're yeah, they're, I think he did five, right, Kelly? Total, he did five. he did five, and then of course the cover, and then uh, the author and artist uh, pictures at the back were also drawn by Brian. Yeah, pictures so at the back. Yeah, yeah where you might have an author photo. We decided to go with a uh, author pen and ink. Oh, nice! I like it. Yeah. So, Philip and Kelly, and maybe I'm asking the wrong person. How did you go around about deciding what images to put into those illustrations? Because I'm fascinated by that process. Well, Philip kind of left that to me for the most part, and I chose the, the images that I thought were really important. And then uh, Philip then contacted me after seeing the images and said, I think we need one more. And so I talked to Brian about that, and we just kind of you know, just kind of hashed it out as far, as far as what we thought were the most uh, visually striking scenes in the book, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think it's part of that, and it's also part that you want to yeah that's the that's the that's the uh, junkyard i was about to say cemetery <laughs> um <laughs> um the uh uh i think I'll, I'll, the other thing that comes into play a little bit is you want obviously you want to spate you don't want to have all five images clumped together so you have to kind of think about pagination and that kind of thing but yeah the image is that there's one image that, that, that i think it's the second image of the book where uh where they find themselves in sabbath lake that is still one of my favorite things ever made for any of my books so far. That's so yeah, Vox did a great job. Yeah, that was the first image she sent me. And then I sent that to you. And I, if I recall, you were having kind of a bad day or something. And I, I said, I you want to see something that. cool? And I sent that to you. And I, I felt like it changed your day. It did. <laughs> it did. Yeah. Yeah. It's hey. always good to see stuff like that. You know, anytime you shot in the arm, anytime you can see something that, you know, that you thought up and, you know it's it's always a, it's always an amazing feeling as, as these two guys who just said their their amazing movie come out i'm sure can attest it's an amazing feeling so even to sing one image it's like you get a rush so i can't even imagine what it's like singing a two-hour movie but uh yeah uh you know we all have our influences whatever creative endeavor we're in um i'm also wondering you mentioned the lake and it immediately, immediately made me think of uh boy's life um have you read that book? And if so, is it any influence? I have not read Boy's Life, surprisingly. I've read a lot oh, of them, wow. but not that one. It's, yeah, it's on my to-do list, but I never, 
I Somebody tell that. this guy to read. I know it's Boy's amazing. Life. It's like the best coming of age <laughs> horror book I've ever written and all that stuff. And I, I just. It's great. I've read. Uh, I've just never gotten for whatever reason. It's. I literally have. A, I have a really beautiful edition of it. I have the subterranean uh, edition of it, and I just. Um, it's very day, magical. Yeah, you'll you'll like it a lot, Philip. I think. But yeah. No. I just. I don't know. I. I don't know. Um, I don't know the impetus of the lake, other than I think when I was writing Soda Jerk, which is the first Sabbath story I wrote, I just had this idea of him showing her these different areas, and I liked the idea of there being a big lake that is oddly always empty and um and this kind of forest that's oddly kind of dark and this junkyard that's oddly kind of big you know on this main street that's got all these kind yeah, of yeah i love it so it's a lot of yeah so i just think i just like having different things to play with you know kind of creating a sandbox for myself um so i think that was just the lake seemed like a natural fit because lakes freak me out you know it, it can be done badly but I'm sure yours is not, but you know, I've all, I'm always a sucker and all, no matter how many times I see it, like boy's life or Commodore or, or, or uh, summer of night, anything like that. I'm just a sucker for small town and weird things are happening behind the scenes. I just love it. I, I know I'm not the only one. A lot of people like that. But, I, I would uh, say that if you arrange your bookshelf in order of coming of age stories, this is going to sit nicely right there between Boy's Life and Summer of Night. Uh, I don't doubt it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Summer of Night. I've read that probably three times, and that's a thick book. That's a doorstopper. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. A good one. I never read the sequel um winter something winter uh a winter haunting winter it's haunting. just okay it's about the writer kid he's grown up and he's sort of a he's sort of a writer but more of a failed writer and he goes to uh take some time off i think if i remember right it's been it's been years to uh um stay in dell's old house and try to write do it you know write his novel Mm. so and uh as the title suggests there is a haunting so but it it's just not the same kind of book as summer of night no so if you never read a winter haunting i, I don't think you're you're missing out at all so in fact i wish you would have stopped with those characters at a winter haunting no oh, interesting yeah i mean, I mean not know. at summer of night sorry yeah, it's a weird. Yeah, it's a weird thing when you have something like that. Is uh, you don't want to spoil the soup, you know. And it's kind of uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting. I, I, you know, I was asked recently to write a, a, you know, a sequel of sorts to Alter, a short story I wrote called Alter, and uh, and I was really hesitant to do it. And I wrote it for a special edition that's coming out pretty soon, and um, and I was really hesitant to do it because I was like, I really, I think that story is like it's kind of just like I don't, you know, it's kind of like I kind of like where it's at, and. Um, but then it was fun to explore like what happened to one of these characters. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it, it, I, it, there's, a, there's, some, there's some anxiety to that where you don't want to, you want to leave well enough alone, so to speak. But um, yeah, so, it's a, that first one's a good one. So Philip, a couple of comments and questions from the people who are watching live. Uh, Thomas Joyce says, Apollyon Forest in the town of Sabbath. Strange name, where did it come from, Philip? Oh. And Alan Hughes says, well, yeah. It's not an easy show if I don't end up buying something on Kindle. <laughs> so. uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Al. Al I think it's yeah, Al P Apollyon. It's a, 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 I wrote yeah, it like it's in the Bible, murder. isn't he the devil in the Bible? There's yeah, so you probably just Google it. A P O L L Y N, I think. But uh, yeah, so I, there's definitely some uh, there's definitely some sinister um, meaning to to the naming, you know, and even like um, and that's something I learned. That's a tip I learned from. Uh, from Laird Barron, actually, we were talking about one of my stories once, and um, and he said every now and then I like to throw in uh, just like a little, you know, a little a little uh, Easter egg of sorts, and um, you know, I'll name something a particular thing to kind of hint at where the story's going, and and so I I, I kind of stole that from from Laird with with Alter actually, and uh, and also with with my Sabbath stories, but yeah, I, I haven't I'm and this is I, this is kind of a you know sad out but i haven't i wrote that story in 2019 so i don't i don't really remember 100 percent why i named uh why i named it everything uh, this forest the way i did but um but yeah i'm sure if you google it it'll it'll make sense yeah 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 it's in the bible um all right anything else? i know you have to go pretty soon philip 
Um, Worry about me, but yeah, but I also want to get to the movie stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kelly, anything else before we get to the movie stuff? That is it. Uh, just a big thanks to Philip for trusting me with this story and to uh, my business partner, Rick, for helping me out with it and everybody who has uh, purchased and played along at home. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And I should say um, that Kelly and uh, in a. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, OK. So here, uh, uh, Polly on to answer the question, is the angel of the bottomless pit? In the Bible. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So he's in charge of that whole situation. He or she, I don't mean to be sexist. Um, yeah. the, um, uh, uh, the other thing I was going to say about Kelly is Kelly made, and Rick made these uh, really neat bookmarks for mm -hmm. Commodore that have the imagery on, on it and stuff like that. And I'm off, I've been offering to anyone who buys the book. I don't even care if you buy, if you buy the Kindle or you buy the paperback. Um, if you message me on Facebook or whatever, or email me through my website, I'll mail you a signed bookmark for your copy. I have a bunch. So Kelly sent me a bunch. So I just right, ordered well, paper back. It's going to get here Tuesday. <laughs> awesome. Oh, cool. Well, if you want one, send me your address and I'll, and I'll mail you a, a, a bookmark. They're really neat. I don't, I don't have one with me. I'm not, my wife is cleaning. So I have to do this from downstairs. So I don't have my stuff. They usually my props, but they're really cool. Kelly should have one. I think that, yeah. oh. I, He's the publisher after all. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure I have one somewhere. <laughs> anyway, th yeah, th it's the cover of the book on the thing they made the, the kids in the car image and stuff like that so it's really yeah so again uh just uh go to the show notes if you're interested in purchasing this book uh really good price on the kindle and not a bad price at all on the print which uh, costs more money to put out of course than a kindle version especially with so. the color yeah i think this guys wanted to make those guys wanted it to look really sharp and I, mm. I appreciate it, but it adds a couple bucks. You got to do that color is expensive. So, Oh yeah. yeah. We, we picked the expensive paper and the, the nicest color. So it's, you know, yeah, it's not, a, it's a nice, yeah. It's a quality paperback. Philip, uh, for Kasi, do you want to start off the movie uh, thing with uh, questioning Jalot since you guys are buddies? Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you've I'm, seen yeah. the film. You've you seen the film. I've taken. I just watched it. I just watched it last night. I yeah. Awesome. Well, actually, I should say I bought it last night because it was only it's only three dollars more to buy it. Yeah, I noticed to that. Rent it. And so I was like, well, for three bucks, I can watch it again at my leisure. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It, it was. It was. You know, it's funny. It's one of those things where you. It's definitely um, much like some of my stuff does in the literature side. It's definitely grasping an era. Uh, by you know, by by the horns and dragging it into the you know into the present. Uh, it's it's you know for fans of heavy metal and all that kind of stuff. It's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a wild wild ride. And but it's you know but it's not as um, based on the trailer. I was expecting it to be a little bit more. Um, uh, I would say I guess loosely plotted, or you know or more. But actually, it's pretty. It's actually pretty linear. Um, plot for the most part like this is definitely a story there and it's a, and it's uh that it travels you know through time and stuff and um and yeah it was it was it was it was a wall i mean there's the, the ultra violence and the best part about the ultra violence and i made commented this to stephanie when we we're watching it i was like i love how all the ultra violence is sort of slow like they're not just like in morgan's the animator right so they weren't just like you know, when you see like a blur of an ax and like some guy explodes in blood, these guys were like really just kind of like taking their time with that. Like, here's comes coming at you. And so you just kind of have these like kind of like people just like, oh, and the heads are popping off and they're splitting in half. And, yeah, I agree with what you said about uh, I read a couple of reviews that said that it was it was several different stories, um, you know, and, and to me, it was just it was very linear, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, is, I mean, I, I'm not I saying that in any negative sense at all. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I didn't have to really ask a question. I would like to know, I, I could sort of, I could totally see it. And this is kind of something else they did in the old days was you could always buy like the book version, you know, of the movie. And I'd right. love to see the book version of, uh, of Spine of Night with all the, with all the images and everything and, and have some text, you know, going and because uh, it was a lot of. It was a lot of fun. It was a really cool story. And, and Philip and uh, Morgan really went, they really went um, deep, you know, on this one. There's some, <laughs> deep, some elements deep and violent. Like, yeah, you don't even, where you're kind of wondering, like, how did they come up? 
how do they even think of that? Like, how does that even, yeah. how does that even enter the realm of, uh, of like, Oh, you know, it'd be a good idea, you know? Um, but yeah, it's a pretty, it's a really wild. Let's have some flowers, burn a guy to death. That's what, it's yeah, what cosmic we need. Flowers, man. <laughs> cosmic flowers, uh, flowers of the gods. I love it. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah. So yeah, what was you. the genesis of this guys? Uh, Morgan, go ahead, please. Um, i had been doing like some very tedious graphic design work for most of my twenties. And then I was just really sick of it. I was like, I'm going to get back to the thing I wanted to do when I went off to school as to try to do film. And, uh, you know, with a graphic design background, um, I'd done some animation, but I'd mostly done live action film in college. And, you know, I wanted to tell big fantasy stories. And the way to start with that seemed to go back to my love of, you know, Ralph Bakshi in that era where there's a, a fair amount of rotoscope fantasy kind of everywhere right when I was a kid. So I always loved that look and it seemed like something that no one was doing and that I was capable of doing even in my very little apartment. But because you can make, you know, you can film someone and, you know, use the approach to then put them on top of a, you know, impossibly huge mountain. So... I did a couple of short films to sort of reverse engineer the process. You know, we were like watching the behind the scenes on the Fire and Ice Blu-ray or DVD back then, I guess. And, uh, you know, just try to figure out how they did it, try to reproduce it. And I did a couple of shorts and then eventually I did uh, Exordium, which was sort of sort of feeds into the same story as The Spine of Night. And it made its way through, there's this long defunct now, um, the Machinima Interactive Film Festival <laughs> that, that I think was just an experiment they were trying. They don't, they, they don't even exist anymore, I don't think. But uh, that ended up getting sent to Phil and Phil reached out to me. Yeah, so I saw Exordium, the short film, and was like, oh, this is rad. This is the type of fantasy that I would like to do. And at the time, this was, a while ago, just to give you the scope of time it took to make this film, we shot the live action reference in 2014, right? So it took a very, very long time to, <laughs> to get the animation done. So I probably saw Exordium in 2013. Um, and at the time, I uh, had written Europa Report, but had been doing a lot of screenwriting work that I hated and was just frustrated and cynical about the world. So I saw Exordium and was like, oh, hey, this is awesome. I want to make something like that. So I sent Morgan a message and was like, Hey, I love your movie. Do you want to, you know, do you want to make something either in the same world as, as Exordium or do you have something else you want to do? Like, let's figure out how to do something. Um, and from there, uh, you know, Morgan had a bunch of ideas, um, you know, for the world, basically, uh, you know, what this, what the story might be and actually Morgan, you tell this part you got it oh sure uh yeah i mean it, it took exordium itself it's only an eight minute short but it took 10 months to animate and so it's a lot of time you know all day every day sitting at the computer you know rotoscoping is uh famously time consuming as we learned a lesson we learned over and over again <laughs> but uh there's a lot of time to th just to think about the world and like what else could be done with it and what I don't know, just places it would be interesting to take this sort of, um, I don't want to call it, I mean, it's pretty, there's a lot of cosmic magic for, to call it low fantasy, but, you know, a, a lower fantasy uh, world and sort of see what like unexplored areas we could go into there. So we had, when, once we started talking about it, it there was a, a wealth of sort of ideas and sketches I'd had and, you know, Phil, you know, was amazing to work with, like just expanding these into like a bigger and better thing than I'd ever dreamed of. You know, I mean, I think there's a, probably a lot of peril to co-writing anything, but I mean, he's brilliant and it was an absolute pleasure to see it just get better and better with collaboration. I don't want to scream Lovecraft at everything, but while watching it, it <laughs> please there go did, ahead. <laughs> yeah, there, there there did seem to be very much some elements of cosmic horror in it. Um, I actually wrote down a line, guys, if you'll indulge me, uh, from the movie. I went beyond the stars, beyond time. There I saw the truth in the face of the endless light. Everything mankind fights and dies for, lives and hopes for, it is meaningless. It is all for naught, and I know. 
you doing what every guardian before me, uh, and I know, uh, I think I wrote that down wrong, what every guardian before me had known, that humanity must be protected from that truth, you know, yep. which made me think of the, you know, uh, the obvious quote, the most merciful thing in the world, uh, a quote from Lovecraft called yep. Thulu. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that we, well, a couple of things. Like, I don't know that I could work on a romantic comedy and not have it be somehow inspired by Lovecraft ultimately at this point. Like I just, you know, and, and not just Lovecraft, there are other sort of foundational things that are inspirational to me, but well, it's just, sneak, it certainly sneaks into Europa report. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's certainly in Europa report. It's in, it's, uh, you know, it's just one of those things I don't think I could escape. That yeah. being said, I don't know that we ever, um, specifically talked about Lovecraft, but we definitely talked a lot about um, cosmic horror in yeah, general. Yeah. It was around the time, what's the book? Um, you have the t-shirt for it, Morgan. What's the- Oh, In the Dust of This Planet? Yeah, that one, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so that kind of stuff was all very much in the um, creative ether, so to, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, yeah, that's, that's some light reading. You know, before bedtime. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I, I think I had to read it four times before I really felt like I had parsed his argument. And yeah. I, I have the two sequels he wrote, and I have not even cracked them open. You know, that like the Taoism has a Winnie the Pooh simplification. I think they're going to come out with a Winnie the Pooh uh, nihilism and, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing, explaining these concepts. So we'll see. Can I ask you a question? No. Mike? Yes. Okay. May I, <laughs> may I ask a question? Yes. I, just, I wanted to ask if the exordium, because I didn't want to forget, is the exordium the short movie? Is that available anywhere? Yeah. It's, um, you can just go to gorgonaut.net or look it up on YouTube. It's on both. Okay. Although the Blu ray is going to have a 4K remaster okay. with some beautiful film grain. Anyway, the Blu ray is fine if Knight's going to have it on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Before we continue, I, I just have to say I'm looking at Kelly Young's background and I'm like, you son of a bitch, send me some of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it is, everybody's got a great backdrop. Our, all the bookshelves cool. on display are amazing. My, my yeah. house is like a 1970s toy museum. <laughs> you like the guy from that? that that's the perfect Africa. bachelor pad, man. Yeah. Um, I, and the other, I, the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I have a question. Uh, a twofold, actually. Um, to Phil, uh, you have 30 seconds. Would, would it have killed you to have Sammy Hagar record a song called Spine of Night for the soundtrack? Uh, yes. Yes, it would have. Yep. Okay. Yep. And secondly, <laughs> then for Morgan, um, the the rotoscope stuff is so interesting to me. Was oh, nice any you. anytime there is a a human on screen, is that always rotoscoped? Or were there times where you were able to just freeform some animation because you didn't have the shot? I'm thinking of like the shots where they're on horseback and everything the horses didn't look exactly rotoscoped but were the riders rotoscoped the it, it's all kind of a, a mixture like i think there's um i think there's the perception with rotoscoping that you're constricted to like the physical action or like what you've captured on footage but it's in practice you're we did it very traditionally there's nothing automated in here so it's all by hand frame by frame so like you, you muted somehow <laughs> it's all it's all sort of um you know like it's live all the time so if you need to change something you just change whatever you need i think i did that morgan i was trying to mute myself and i hit yours instead that's okay that's okay. sorry about that um so like so it's all sort of a mixture like if the live action wasn't useful i just ignored it and if it was useful then i would use it and it's almost the most useful for like lip sync or like capturing actors performances that i would never think to add a particular like nervous finger twitch or something that just makes the performance more alive feeling but in terms of like what were we, it what was rotoscoped and what wasn't i mean the characters i mean we shot reference for I think pretty much every character you saw, but for the, the horseback specifically, it's um, we took a, like a yoga ball and had the guys just r mount the yoga ball and ride it like it was a horse, which it made for some very funny footage. 
Um, and then it was sort of just an issue of like, yeah, uh, the horses themselves. Obviously, we did not have horses in the warehouse, although that would have been amazing. That would have been great next time. But um, yeah, if that, if that answers your question. I, I, yeah, have a question. I, I noticed, I noticed uh, a couple of the nervous ticks you're talking about, like some of the eye movements were so realistic. I was like, wow, that really, that really helped in that case. Uh, like Philip, I collect those books. I've got the original making of heavy metal, the reissued making of heavy metal. Uh, any chance we will get some kind of book that shows some of those behind the scenes photography? I want to see these guys writing yoga balls. I mean, we we made like a documentary that I think is on. I don't haven't heard if anyone has seen it yet, but I think it's on iTunes. But it's it'll be on the Blu-ray as well. But a book would be pretty fun. Uh, some someone else requested that. I forget when, but it'd be. I mean, putting together like a book of all the concept art and stuff would be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I have, have a question. some experience in that. Just so. oh, all right. Well, uh, we'll I may be the only person in the room that doesn't know this, but I, I don't actually know what rotoscoping is or what that what that means. Oh, and I, I'm asking because I'm sure some of the audience don't know either. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those like terms I've been saying for so long that I forget. But of course, it's right. It a yeah, relatively arcane it. <laughs> process. Uh, it's when you. Uh, film in live action, live action reference footage, and then export that those frames or you know capture those frames individually and then animate directly on top of them. So you're constantly like you're animating over each you know frame by frame each bit of live action sort footage. Sort of like that, that old Lord of the Rings movie. Yes. Yeah. Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, that one and uh, Fire and Ice were sort of the two big touchstones we were really working from i also Visually. i read a, a interview with lucy lawless where she was talking about how unlike other animated movies she had to match her her talking to the lips because that was already done instead of vice versa as yes. is usually done yeah um i mean a long long time ago we kind of you know, i mean we cast the um the, the motion reference actors i mean they're all very accomplished actors and gave incredible performances and a lot of and at some point in the process we realized that we had well i mean we didn't hire a sound guy and we had tried to do it ourselves so it, the results were uh pretty much unusable um unfortunately <laughs> And so once we realized we had to re-record everything anyway, and we'd already animated the mouths, uh, it was just sort of what had to happen. I think in an ideal scenario with endless money and time, we would have, you know, tried to record them as the motion references as well. But as it ended up, you know, uh, Phil had to do a lot of the, the hard part of coaching them through the reverse lip syncing. But, uh, you know they didn't i i couldn't i was confident it was going to come back like a dubbed italian film and <laughs> i couldn't believe how skillful they were at putting new performances into the cadence that we had animated and and i polished it up a little bit like i went back in and tried to fix the parts where it didn't quite land manually yeah uh, i would love to say that that was all my coaching but it turns out highly <laughs> professional uh actors who've been working for a very long time it's just like a thing it's like in their repertoire whether they know it is or not so there was a little it, bit of coaching it turns out that that they're very talented <laughs> turns out they know what they're doing even even when you ask them to do something like this which is something they're not really used to doing for well, somebody i got else's the feeling i want to ask you how you snag these big names and congratulations on that but before i do yeah you know, again in this article interview with lucy lawless she was she said that her representative did not want her to do this yeah, this but, is my favorite story. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, talk about that because she was uh, evidently really wanted to do it. She thought yeah. a lot of it, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, um, I mean, I can answer both questions at the same time, sort yeah, of. Please. I can be more specific about others if you want me to. But, yeah, you know, when, go we, ahead. when we got to the point that we were recasting the voice, the, you know, do it, casting the bigger names to redo the voices. We tried to approach people that we thought would um, understand what we were doing, like basically like big name nerds. So like Joe Manganiello is yeah, Pat Nozzle. Yeah, Pat Nozzle. Joe definitely Manganiello a big as well. name nerd. Yep. Uh, and then um, for Lucy, uh, she 
isn't a nerd, I don't think, but she has just like she's like well, she's done a lot of nerd yeah. things. And she's but... and she's like genre royalty, right? So I I yeah. was like um I was the one that really pushed for Lucy just because I've always loved her and and uh just thought that she was like a great personality and, and would really be great for the part. So we sent her the movie and I could tell um when she had watched it because like the link I sent I could like monitor when it had been viewed and yeah. I could monitor when it had been viewed in New Zealand and I was like well there's only one person who would watch it in, in, in New Zealand probably so pretty quickly after that we got uh, an email back from her agent saying oh you know she really wants to do it but then suddenly like nothing happened like it was just like like you're like, really like, great Lucy Lawless is going to do it and then there was um, silence and uh that silence was that one of her other representatives didn't want her to do it because of the way the character is drawn, um, both because the character is naked, but also because she's not drawn in like your traditional overly sexualized, like female body way. She's sort of dressed, she's, she's drawn like a, like a, you know, like a woman, like a real woman, which Lucy thought was amazing, but which her rep was like, please don't, you don't want people to see you this way. I think was, was, no, the, was I, the I, quote. I think yeah. it's amazing too, that you didn't go yeah. for that you know, 105 pound, you know, model looking uh, animated woman. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was amazing too, by the way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. As a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, that, that was the issue there was basically just her, uh, one of her reps being like, you shouldn't take this role and her being like, well, I I mean, it's crazy to me that, that Lucy Lawless, again, like genre royalty, like she's, you know, amazing and has been around forever that one of her reps would be like, don't don't take this part because people will see you as this, you know, I mean, whatever, see you as this other amazing character who just happens to look different. It's, it's really um, frustrating, but eventually she, uh, we, we managed to make a deal with her and record with her. And she, I think we first heard that we must have first heard that story from her. So I also love that she's willing to be like, yeah, this, this happened to me and it's ridiculous. Um, but she was great. I mean, I was, I was uh, starstruck by all of them. Um, probably her and Richard E. Grant the most uh, because they're, you know, so amazing, but um, Lucy was really great and really like had thought very deeply about the character and were like, really like, had all these different options for the accent and wanted to make sure that the character didn't feel too much like a warrior woman. Cause she's not a warrior woman. She's like a, you know, she's a, a shaman or a priestess or whatever, like really had, right. had um, thought very deeply about it before we had even had any discussion about it at all, which was really incredible. Um, yeah. But I mean, that's, that's sort of the story, how we got all of them. We just tried to be a bit like, I always say this, but you know, one always tries to be curatorial about who you're approaching for a part. Um, but in this case, it was both in terms of who fit the part and also who, you know, was a dork and would would get it. You know, would would immediately be like, oh, I want to be in the rotoscope animated ultraviolet fantasy film. That was actually a question that I was going to ask. Did you go yeah. for, um, you know, people who you thought might be geeky enough to to yeah. to love this stuff, as we all are here? You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, That's when great. we uh, Joe Manganello, who's a, a lovely human being, uh, when I when we he, well, most of the people we recorded during COVID, so it was just like I sat at my computer like I am right now, and they were at their computer someplace, and we recorded that way. We recorded Joe before COVID, um, so I got to go. I was like in a, an actual studio with him, and when we came in, the first thing. <laughs> thing he said is like oh yeah i watched the first five minutes of this movie and i was like oh crazy people made this movie and i want to work with the crazy people <laughs> i was <laughs> like yeah well great i don't That's know if i great, present man. as crazy but i'm glad you could tell <laughs> I, I think i present as crazy <laughs> to be to be fair to be whatever fair. works right <laughs> yeah 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 uh so okay anyone else have any questions or comments on the movie i have a question yes please um so speaking of cartoon nakiness because there is a lot of nakiness in this yep. movie i'm wondering like if there are any um issues or hurdles or permissions or anything that you had to go through um to get this out into the world uh, since it's cartoon nakiness and not you know right. literal nakiness uh so yes I mean, a couple things. I mean, <laughs> we can approach that question from many angles. Morgan, why don't you why don't you hop on this one? Because we oh go ahead. And then I'll, I'll okay. Back up. <laughs> well, from a production standpoint, yeah. Um, one extra was perfectly happy, almost 
overwhelmingly <laughs> to be naked for every shot, but was the only one who was. Everyone else was uh, wearing some kind of bodysuit or something. So on set, it was 99% not naked. And um, and I think, you know, we had the character designs were up. I think, it, you know, everyone was aware of our general goals. Um, you know, I, I definitely, there was a lot of shots where it's like, you want to be respectful and like, but also not, you know, self-censor what you're doing, you know, to the point that it's taking away from what you're trying to do. So, you know, I'd, I had to call my wife in quite a few times over the years to be like, okay, how naked is this shot? <laughs> because, you know, sometimes know, people f flipping around with their, their legs wide open in front of the camera <laughs> happens several times. And it's like, you want to make sure that that is, you know, I, I never wanted it to feel like a joke in the in the thing. You know, I wanted it to feel naturalistic, but not like we're all leering at the nudity. So like finding exactly the, the, the right spot to, you know, to come down on like, when does it work and when does it does when doesn't it and i think for the most part we nailed it there's there's one or two shots that just for rotoscoping reasons i think kind of <laughs> ended up being more like when she's sinking into the swamp i feel i feel bad that the only things that were visible above the plane of water as we rendered it were her boobs and her face but except for that <laughs> that's the only one that i think when i see it i feel like yeah. maybe is not uh, hit the taste line quite like i wanted it to but i mean uh upon completion like we didn't have any problems like with censorship up until mm. maybe the last two weeks when suddenly it became apparent to us that like you can't so we have a bunch of posters made i don't know if anybody's seen them one of the posters um we had has the fully naked woman woman on it painted by a really talented painter named sam guay i think is how you pronounce their last name um and so we wanted to use that poster for our international poster. Um, mm -hmm. And and so and what that means basically is iTunes has to approve it. So we were immediately like, well, they're never going to approve a nipple. So we went back and had the artist um, do a little bit of touch up on, on the poster and then resubmitted it. And we're told not by Apple, but by the people who are going to put it up on Apple for us, that that was still unacceptable. Like that, that even, even covered they weren't going to let that much flesh be on a poster, uh, which is crazy to me uh, for an array of reasons. Go ahead, Morgan. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really tasteful. It's entirely in shadows. It's non-sexualized beyond the fact that like just the, the way our Western culture treats uh, any nudity as inherently sexualized. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yeah, I, it's an, a, absolutely incredible poster and uh i mean we we, we ultimately got it got, got it approved there. by yeah. putting the logo uh in the bikini area of her chest <laughs> yeah we moved, so, yeah, we moved just, the title treatment up because, um so I, i've got a couple of questions from the live audience but I, before i get to that i want to ask not that i'm against naked people but you know when the when the movie starts she's climbing up this snowy mountain it's obviously cold and the thought hit my mind why isn't why doesn't she have a fur garment around her or something it what was what was the reasoning for that is that well, part of her her beliefs or something or well, i don't want to spoil the film for anyone who hasn't seen it okay, so if anyone's right. wary about that there's okay someone is signaling that it, well i'm th th you might there's a scene um I don't know how to say it without without saying well, that, that's uh, okay if there's something th in the there's movie there's that an I, in that narrative re that a narrative reason that explains it that is i think a subtle point okay. but is a reference like um alan moore's uh swamp thing yeah 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 <laughs> where anyway uh, um, i'll have to rewatch it and it, it's just it, it it is a subtle point mike All i right. put it in the in the notes in the chat <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> you, I did not catch. Well, I knew yeah, that, but you don't um, find out till later into the film, why? Right? But yes, but but my because I wondered that, the same thing. But then later on, I was like, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> my hope was that that was like the like a bit of a question mark. You'd be like, how is this even possible? Obviously, mm -hmm. magic is afoot, you know, or something yeah. supernatural. Right. Yes, yeah. it did tick me off. Is like, oh, why is she marching at the mountain naked? <laughs> it's like, oh, really? Are we gonna do this? Are we? Yeah. Am I going to have to live tweet my problems with this film? 
like, no. You get in trouble with somebody. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, if we knew it was like a, a stri- hopefully it was going to feel like a striking image. It'd be like, oh, well, that's unusual. And uh, I, I hope it, you know, the, the rationale tracks for people. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you totally achieved the fact of that it's not. Um, it's very organic and not sexualized. I think it's no, just, it's, yeah. you, you got that it was the culture of the people and that there were a lot of other plays into it and not just for no reason. So thank you for that. All right. <laughs> Two questions for from That's the awesome. uh, same person. Uh, question, any plans on expanding this world of Spine of Night on other mediums, books, comics, games, etc.? Um. Uh, Well, we right when we were first selling the film internationally, we had a a Polish distributor who who we heard through the grapevine. The first thing they said was they wanted to make a board game. I have heard literally nothing about it since then, but that it would be a dream if we could do that. And um, I have wanted to do like a black and white magazine sized uh, like Savage Sword of Conan style thing for years even before this project so i it'd be fun if we were able to you know come up with some uh like comic book appropriate short stories that'd be really fun you know what um a lot of companies in this situation have lately been doing kickstarters to fund the uh comic book Mm -hmm. their um dune is coming out with a graphic novel for the whole new adaptation Oh. And they have their graphic novel project is on Kickstarter right now. So you could potentially fund that way. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. Yeah. 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 I don't think you guys would have too much trouble, really. Uh, the other question that they have is, and along those lines, if you could work with another artist or writer to expand this world on another medium, uh, who would you like to work with? So oh, that's an interesting question. That's, a, that's, that's really sort of one of those questions where you like, you'll think of the answer like <laughs> at 11 o'clock tonight, you know, and say, oh, I should have said that. I, I'm going gonna, gonna, to, um, it's easy to blank on it. I'm going to deflect that question by, uh, by saying, I'm going to talk about our posters again and say that we, <laughs> so the, the, the four posters, God, how many posters do we have now? Five posters. Um, and the, for four of them, we just approached artists that we liked. And one of the artists we approached is Ian Miller, um, who is an artist that you guys probably know his work if you don't know his name. He like he did a ton of the early Warhammer 40,000 and Warhammer fantasy roleplay artwork. And he did backgrounds for Wizards, um, for Bakshi's Wizards. And his artwork is just incredible. So, uh, I mean, and he did like a graphic novel adaptation of an M. John Harrison short story, The Luck in the Head. Just... He's just wild uh, and one of my favorite artists of all time. And we got to hire him to do a poster for us. So I would uh, want to work with Ian Miller again. <laughs> like yeah. if, I, if, I, if I had to pick, pick an artist off the top of my head, uh, even though we already have worked with him. Um, but yeah, beyond that, I don't know. That's such a, that's such a difficult question. Um, can, I say one I, I, can I say one thing? It, I, I, think, I think a great fit would be, would be our, our mutual friend, uh, Laird Barron. I mean, that was, I could see yeah. him. I could, I could see. Oh, like, he really likes the film. That's how I found out about into, it. Into the appropriate prose. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I could certainly imagine it. I think that'd be very cool. Yeah. Hey, Mike, I got yes. to run. Do you mind? All right, buddy. But I want to say goodbye to everybody. I don't want to just be rude and leave. And also, I want, can, I, can, I st- can I sneak in one question? Was the, 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 with, I don't want to give anything away in the movie, but was there a Nephilim influence? Bill? Oh, uh, not explicitly, at least from my from my perspective. I don't know, Morgan. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, it's it's so hard to know. Like, I even watching it years right, later, I sometimes I see something and I'm like, oh, I bet I got that from that, and it didn't even <laughs> occur to me when we were making it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bubbled up from the subconscious. There's yeah. like an Enoch connection there. All right. Thank, thanks for being here, Phil. Well, the movie's amazing. It's thank I you. watched last night. It's so good. I want you to go watch it tonight. And and also uh, I want to say thank you to Kelly, who did an amazing job with Commodore. I couldn't be happier. And I hope I hope everybody reads it. Uh, the perfect stocking stuffer, as I told Kelly this morning. Um, all right, guys, enjoy. I got to run. I'm so sorry, but I'll. Talk all right, you. no problem. See you, Philip. Hi. Um. So, uh, guys, what is your uh, what's 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 next from here for you guys? 
Uh, so that's also that, that's really me looking at Phil, but our Brady Bunch <laughs> screens don't necessarily make my my look go the right way. Uh, now, let's see. I'm looking at what the. Okay, so if I look up, I'm looking at Kelly. Okay, I'm above you for me. Yeah, doesn't look that way here, but. Um, I mean we, well, I mean for this particular setting, I mean I I think the question is going to really boil down to like uh, how how the film does and how much people want to pay us to do more <laughs> because like it's animation is expensive and time consuming and even you know trying to do it on you know an independent level like we only have so many animators it's really just me and two other guys at any time so you know i mean that's why it took seven years to draw it yeah. so you know we'd have to work at like a pipeline where we could really pay people a lot of people to uh work on it so it was more like a three-year project and less like a seven to eight-year project. Um, but we have definitely written stuff, like outlines and, uh, you know, pitches and drafts and stuff. So I, there's a lot more we could tell with this if the opportunity arose. Yeah, but. absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, I would love to return to the world of the movie and do either, I mean, to be slightly more specific, we have sort of charted out sequel stories but then also because of the way that this, you know the narrative structure of the movie works you know it, it jumps through time moving forward and part of the reason to do that was was to leave you know gaps that one could go back in and, and fill with other types of stories and do spin-off stories or you know whatever it's it's like a fantasy world for you to imagine into basically uh and it would be fun to get the chance to do that with with uh you know some of the characters and some of the stuff that we cut out of the movie because we didn't have enough time to get it done there's a you know there's a whole world there and a whole like span of history as well well and 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 you're getting obviously extra coverage um because you know people like lucy lawless and pat oswald and and the others were willing to do it um you know that that's that's a wise move you know get them on board yeah 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 you you garner more attention yeah absolutely yeah. yeah uh yeah it's true um so i i like to ask this of, of artists and creative types for for the both of you what what's your definition of success you know moving forward you know like some some one person a writer or a filmmaker might say you know uh, I want to be Stephen King or I want to be Steven Spielberg or whatever, but you know, what is it that if you accomplish this in this field, you feel like you're, you're being successful. Oh man, that's, I mean, for so many years, I was, it was the idea that I could even accomplish a finished feature film. Like I, I'm sure the people back at the bar back in Philly where I don't even live anymore have no idea that it's done you know i used to be like oh yeah i'm working on a movie we're you know trying to get this movie done for years and people be like when's the movie coming out i'm like well it's gonna be a long time so like that was like always like the peak of the everest we were climbing was just being able to do it at all because it was such a uh i mean seven years all day every day with very little breaks so uh, I've sort of just been coasting in, in through this, you know, like a quiet, po you know, period after that, you know, everything's still closed for COVID. So, yeah, or, you know, relatively. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, so that felt like a success in and of itself, but I think in the more abstract way, it'd be like, what I really want is someone to find this years decades after I'm dead and just be like, look at this weird guy who made this weird thing and they pass it around on whatever, uh, you know, VR social media platform they're on <laughs> in the post-apocalyptic wastes and be like, look at this weird thing I dug up. And uh, I think just having anything left, like it feels like a, I don't know, like a headstone. <laughs> Maybe that's grim, but I, no, I, I just see to be remembered it. Well, even if I'm not remembering, just like that, the to have made a piece of work that can like exist in the ether of you know, like horror and fantasy, and, you know, all the things that I loved. It just feels like a way to be a part of it. Someone talked about writing uh, once, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, and, and I think it applies to any creative endeavor, filmmaking, uh, painting, whatever. 
that you're sitting more or less alone or, you know, with a small group of people and you're creating something, depending on what it is you're creating. If you're a writer, you're probably sitting in a room alone writing. And then years later, people that you don't know that you never will meet are enjoying this that thing that you did, that you created um, and getting pleasure from it and maybe even being ex- inspired by it, you know? So, yep. I mean, that, that would be incredible. Just, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Phil, I've been wondering the whole time what success for this oh, looks like for uh, you. <laughs> because uh, <laughs> I'm always worried that we're not hitting it because I don't no. know what it looks like. I mean, I, uh, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I tend to define success for any project the same, which is just like, uh, I mean, ultimately it's a pretty um, selfish view of success, which is just like, I just want to be able to think that we did everything possible to make the thing all that it could be, which I think we accomplished for this. And then the second part of that is just, you know, I want to be able to do m- more. Like, like as soon as the thing is done, I get... Um, uh, you know, like I, I don't like to think about it anymore. Like for, this movie's a little bit different because it, I, I am quite happy with it, um, and it's it's fun to talk about. But usually, I would I'm much happier actually making a thing than to have finished a thing. So, so success for me tends to be like, oh, can I can I go on and start the next thing now? Because that's yeah. what I really like to do is the act of creation, not so much the act of finishing or or all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, Kelly, what's next for? strange eons what is there something next on the horizon that you can talk about or well a big fucking break this was a pain in the ass <laughs> um, but, but i'm, I'm not going gonna, to bed for six months i'm not gonna i'm not gonna just not do anything in fact uh pete rollick sent me a story that i thought was really really interesting and i'm just kind of trying to figure out what to do with it but yeah i'll keep doing some something uh it's going to be you know along these lines it's going to be a a strange eons version of a of a of a novel or a novella though there'll, there'll be something different i feel very much like if philip had given this story to somebody else to print it would not have looked anything like what we did with it and that's kind of the strange eons thing that we've got going for us is we're very yeah, it looks graphic great design oriented yeah but i've got a question for these guys if i can still talk about spine and night please um, so this is this is going to sound kind of gauche, but take it from someone who's also been making films and stuff like that. Um, hiring actors to act these scenes out, then hiring people like Lucy Lawless and Pat Oswalt to voice them, that might not be millions of dollars, but it's not nothing. Where did the funding come for this before you guys... I mean, did you have some kind of proof of concept that you sent out to somebody and, and they they funded this or did you have a distribution deal before you were finished? Because I know what it's like to go through this and it's like fucking impossible. <laughs> yeah. So when we started, no, we didn't have anything. It was literally, I was just like, hey, I'll rent us a warehouse and I'll put the money together to hire our, our motion capture actors, you know, and I, I, because of, I've been doing this long enough, I know. I knew a bunch of actors in New York who could, who would do it. I mean, we paid everybody, but we didn't pay them a ton of money. Um, so basically I put together enough to get us started, which was like, we're at the warehouse, get the, um, get motion cap, motion reference actors at first group of actors together. And then enough to get us our animation started basically. Um, and then that sort of push got us through, you know, it got us started. And then at a, it, the other reason for being in the bigger names was basically because we needed more money. Right. So, so those two things sort of happen concurrently, right? Like you need, you need the names to get the money, but you need the money to get the names. So you, so I, at that point I approached other producers who I've worked with before um, and was able to show them a proof of concept, but that proof of concept was, you know, here's 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I don't remember how much we had at that point animated and colored and with backgrounds. So it, so it's, it's much less a leap of faith at that point when you can see, you know, what the movie's going to look like. Um, and it's, it's, the, you know, the, that same proof of concept, so to speak, is also what we sent to the actors so that they weren't just like looking at our crazy fantasy script and wondering what the hell it was going to look like. They could look at it and understand, you know, that we were going to, um, you know, what it was going to look like when it was finished. Um, but really at the beginning there, there was no, 
you know, it was just just more going to be being like, okay, let's go, <laughs> let's let's figure out how to make this happen, and we'll just start. Um, it's a real a real leap of faith. Yeah, <laughs> in it. hindsight, yeah. yeah, it was it was crazy, frankly. When when <laughs> when it in the uh, I mean, it was the most like feeling for me at the time. It felt like being you know plucked out of you know like the minor leagues to come up and do something you know infinitely harder and infinitely more expensive and complicated than i'd ever even imagined i was capable of so i i mean you're uh the faith in the project in the sticking with it over i mean the better part of a decade frankly is just a remarkable and admirable i think for anyone any creative project uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the one other thing I'll say about that is like, you know, part of my, when I talked about what was starting the project before and saying I was annoyed at my screenwriting career at the time, and that annoyance extends, extended to things like having to deal with getting producers on a project and having to deal with notes and having to deal with like sort of the, I mean, notes are a complicated thing because, you know, at a certain level, they'll make a thing better, but beyond that, they'll, they just sort of exist to be in the way. Uh, and at the time I was like, no, they always exist to be in the way. So I was like, what happens if you just don't do that? What happens if you just rent a warehouse, write a fantasy script and just fucking go shoot it and just, and just start, um, it takes a while, but it turns out, it turns out pretty good. I think like so, experiment, so, you know, <laughs> but so you're doing that. And then at what point do you go, Oh, let's see if Lucy Lawless will do this. Uh, how does that <laughs> That four seems years, to be a, kind of a joke. Four years later, I think. Okay. Four years later, we're like four or five years later. We're like I think, I think we maybe need Lucy Lawless to come in, to come help our project. I think, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it, I, I don't have any other questions about the film. I just hope people will click the link in the show notes and uh, and rent it or buy it. Um, I got a uh, question. I got a question. Yes, please. Now, I, I made an assumption with this movie. I just want to make sure the assumption is correct. It's, this fantasy world is supposed to be Earth rather than another planet. I, I guess I sort of imagined it as, as a, uh, like, like a, in the multiverse, you know, it's sort of a, uh, a like a, a, a fantasy parallel to it rather than specifically Earth. Um, but, I mean, I think that the way that the you know ages of fantasy worlds work and the huge expanses of time it could it could just as easily have fit all of human civilization into one of those windows for sure yeah because i was i was wondering if it was earth where where geographically does it take place just like in you know conan uh Samaria, so of ancient england <laughs> yeah i mean i guess it's sort of like a like a combination of all of those things that we made sort of a conscious effort to not map it too strictly um you know i feel like a lot of uh fantasy stuff and i i love a big fantasy map where you can learn where everything is but we wanted to do something that was where the the maps were a lot more fuzzy and unwritten so i mean there's like a vague sense of like this is what's up in the north this is in the south this is sort of in the middle and just sort of uh, left it at that. You know, I tried, you know, some of the short films are definitely have more of a, like a, a, a desert setting. <laughs> you know, we have, I wrote something in a jungle setting, but uh, so, I mean, I think it's, but just to get to the big snowy mountain, it was pretty much inherently going to be somewhat Northern and probably European ish. Mm -hmm. If that, if that makes sense. And so, so what uh, guys, what are some of your favorite horror movies or books or anything similar, sci-fi horror or whatever, uh, that you've either watched lately and really loved or influenced you as filmmakers oh, or man. both? I mean, <laughs> when we were, um, it was like year two in this project, and I thought mm -hmm. to myself, I'm going to be working on this for an entire college degrees amount of time and it turns out arguably a phd's amount of time <laughs> but uh i thought i was like i felt like i'd seen a lot of films but when we were on set working with actors and filmmakers uh, i realized that i'd seen a normal person's a large amount of films for a normal people, person and then that i really uh had a lot of areas of deficiency that everyone else had the shorthand for <laughs> so i was like oh 
I'm going to watch a movie every single day while we make this. So, and since then, I've watched lots and lots and lots of movies. So, which I think bled into the process too, because we we're still able to modify stuff as we went. So, in terms of, so it's like what what I saw during this and what I saw after this and what I've seen recently and like what we should, we should plug uh, we should plug Matt Smith's uh, uh, horror short films again. Okay, they're amazing. Go yeah, ahead. we <laughs> when we were at uh, we went to the Telluride Horror Show in Colorado last month. Last two weeks ago, if it's a blur, but uh, and we saw this amazing short by this guy Matt Reed Smith. Um, it was the provider, and it was really good. Um, which I mean, it's one of those things you watch it, you're like, this guy made this for very little and did, and it's incredibly creepy. Long takes, just weird reality that you know, in, in the way like some of the. It's not quite like David Lynch, but it has a bit of that quality to some of like the David Lynch short films. Uh, so that was really good. When people when people do that on a limited budget and they they're able to bring that across, that's inspiring, you know. Yeah, I mean, you watch it and you're just like, someone give this guy a hundred thousand dollars and he's going to give you the creepiest right. movie you've ever seen. <laughs> no. um, but but yeah, uh, man, I'm trying to think. Of, seen a lot of stuff at, as well at as questions festivals. you blank on you know and <laughs> it, it, i do too not you but um and then you think of it like 10 minutes later yeah well so. yeah it's like the answer is either either we're going to be here for 25 minutes as i list off a bunch of stuff i want to tell everyone about <laughs> or, but it's hard to know how like how deep and how exhaustive to go what about you uh, phil you want to shout out anything oh i mean i'm just thinking about things that are that sort of specifically referenced in the film like mm. uh like there's a bunch of hellraiser stuff in there that i don't think i realized was from hellraiser until probably morgan told me that it was from hellraiser and i was like well great it should be from hellraiser we're just gonna keep it <laughs> uh <laughs> and then uh there's a moment uh i see john langan lurking there at the bottom of my screen there's lurking is the correct word <laughs> there's a moment in it that is uh specifically taken from the ninth gate which is a movie that i know he thinks is terrible and most people think is terrible but He's i He's wrong i love the think ninth gate. Thank you very much. I think I think it's amazing. Uh, the, the ninth gate is great. <laughs> I don't need to reopen that can of worms. He just now. left. Yeah. He left. Yeah. No, oh, wow. the conversation away. is over. <laughs> oh man, now he's back. Wow, um, Lingen, you know we we disagree with you, so you just leave. <laughs> wow. Um, there he goes again. Uh, somebody asked. We were at a Q and A in in. Uh, portland maine or i was at least a couple nights ago and somebody asked the same question and i completely blank all i could come up with was hellraiser i was like oh yeah hellraiser <laughs> like for a fantasy film we should have a better answer than there's some hellraiser in there uh, i mean the, the never ending story <laughs> you know you can go with that <laughs> there's there's definitely a couple of creep show references i think is hidden in there like when the um you know the wave of molten steel pours out onto that one guy it's very much i was thinking of the you know the raft from creep show 2. it's full of i mean full of little references and stuff to all of that and blood yes there's there's a bit of blood it's kind of a rom-com wouldn't you say <laughs> yeah romantic yeah. and yeah. you know it gives a beautiful lesson about life and, yeah. and in uh, the end love wins right i think that's how right in the end yeah. Yeah, exactly love wins in the What's, end there's a there's this really i don't remember where i heard it but it's one of my favorite like stupid hollywood stories or not stupid but like somebody was talking about how whenever you're, you're pitching something and they're always going to ask you like what's the what's the theme like what's it really all about and no matter what you've pitched you should just say it's about the triumph of the human spirit and there would be like oh yeah of course yep yep yeah of course so yeah this movie it's about the triumph of the, of the human spirit you start, you've seen <laughs> you've seen rocky right okay it's like that <laughs> like that only yep. with flowers you know so <laughs> a little bit and of magic flowers and bunnies you know yeah. <laughs> uh kelly you're a filmmaker uh you have any questions for these guys regarding this? I mean, uh, I wouldn't would think to ask you to get some Black Sabbath or Journey songs in the soundtrack. <laughs> so, such, wait, a, like, such a critic. Hold on, we should talk about this. So, we, you know, heavy metal, <laughs> the 1982, is it 81 or 82 heavy metal? Two, two. Uh, so when we were making the movie, you know, heavy metal is obviously very much on our mind. Uh, and the idea was to, like, you know, I don't want to. 
I love heavy metal, but like to make a heavy metal that was for the 21st century and that wasn't like embarrassing to watch with people. <laughs> like, like we brought uh, a bunch of the actors to my house to watch heavy metal and, and Betty Gabriel, who went on to be in Get Out and other things came with to, to watch heavy metal with us. She'd never seen it before. And um, as we were watching it, I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm making Betty watch this movie. It's so like, she was not into it. She was like, what the fuck have I gotten myself into? Uh, this is awful. So anyway, there, there's that aspect of it. Part of that is of course the heavy metal soundtrack is like, I mean, I like all that music, but it's it's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> you know, like I love Black Sabbath. I'm into Sammy Hagar, I guess, I, I, at times. Morgan's not. Um, I mean, what, in high school. <laughs> but the uh, but it's a it's it, the, the soundtrack aspect of that movie is weird, right? Because it's sort of like it it enhances the movie, but also like takes you out of the movie when suddenly it's like and now and now you're going to hear you know mob rules for <laughs> for for two minutes or something. So uh, so as much as I would have loved to have, you know, put Black Sabbath in the movie, we tried to, we tried to like, uh, what's, what am I trying to say? Seamlessly weave the music into the movie so that you wouldn't suddenly be like, oh my God, there's like, why, why is Judas Priest like screaming over this battle scene? I mean, you know? I would love to do a film that used a bunch of music that I was like, you know, actively listening to every day. Like it was, I mean, it would be a really fun project. It would just be a very different tone. I think it suits heavy metal but it's way better than our film. Uh, yeah, cool. But, you know. Heavy metal is an R-rated movie that was aimed directly at 12-year-old boys. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's what I said. I, I did, I really enjoyed Spine of Night. I thought it was, uh, it, it ticked off what I loved about heavy metal. Um, but the the story there was was so much more uh there was a lot of depth there that you know let's face it is not in the heavy metal movie and i i just really enjoyed it i really really appreciated the effort that was put into this film uh i i just like you know this is clearly a labor of love well yeah thank you i mean it really was i mean it was i mean i mean maybe a labor of, of obsession because like you can't stop you can't ever <laughs> once you start like what are you going to do with it so but i mean we i think it was it was we loved it and there was it was amazing to be able to work in a way where we just had literally no notes there was no you know like investor pressure to change anything we could just do exactly the thing we wanted to do which is like the amazing part of working independently and it's i think it's pretty rare and why there's so little adult animation out there is that you know, I mean it just the time and the money to, to do it with a, a way where they have to maximize the return by making it an all ages project is um, you know it, it made it made it feel like a really rare special thing we were doing that I was really you know I, I'm in love with the whole idea of it not just the film itself so uh, an, another behind ahead, the Kelly. scenes kind of question then uh, at some point like when you've got Lucy Lawless and Patton Oswald involved you don't have to then shop the film around for distribution or, well, we, we, or do you? I mean, I remember having to go to the American film market and trick or treat my film. Yeah. I'm guessing that was not something you guys had to do with this. You no, know, we didn't, we didn't do that. We, we, uh, we sold the movie out of South by Southwest, right? So we took it to a festival and then once distributor saw it at the festival, um, that's where we found our distributor and, and sold it um, based on the, the festival premiere basically. Very yeah, we didn't we didn't have to do the uh, the AFM thing, thank God, because that's yeah. terrible. Yeah, so nobody wants to do that. Yeah. So the theme that you had in mind in creating this movie, probably more than one theme, but the the over overall theme, was it is, you know, the forbidden knowledge thing, and some secrets are just too much for man to know that sort of thing. I mean, I think that is the richard e grant character's position yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um sure. i'm not sure if it's necessarily my position i i think it's like i think what we think each other is capable of knowing and, and is allowed to know ends up being a big part of like how society organizes its like hierarchical structure you know like it, the uh the idea is like well you know, a kid can't know this. A person in this country couldn't understand this reference. Like we end up creating these uh, barriers, and then justifying our 
position of power because we're like, well, we know all this stuff. We're the elites who now know these things. And so it ends up stratify, stratifying a society. So I think it's, I think thematically it's more like how we use knowledge and withhold knowledge to create power structures and like why we do that and how it shakes out over, a, over time and over the planet. Yeah. Does that track for you, Phil? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just say, like, I, I tend to to think of thematics and films as like questions, not necessarily answers. And I think that the question of the film is 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 basically that, you know, like, uh, I don't know if I could phrase it in a succinct question, but you know, what Morgan said was the question mark at the end of it. <laughs> so, so let me ask a couple of questions here because I'm watching this fantasy film and I'm watching this fantasy film and. I'm watching this empire, you know, wage war on other fantasy empires and kingdoms. And they're going into what appears to be some Assyrian or Egyptian inspired flat people who figured out how to fly. And all of a sudden, there's a steam powered airship. That's okay. So we've just stepped over into some Saruman shit where, <laughs> you know, we're abandoning magic and we're going to build up our, our uh, mechanical and, and there's a, it, it's, it's a really interesting idea that we've seen done before, but you guys have done a really good job of it so much. So it's like, I'm like, is this castle in the sky from <laughs> Studio Ghibli? I mean, well, I mean, I think the idea like, was that you know we to mark it as an even bigger time jump than the last time we'd seen time pass in the film that we're like you know i wanted to like what is the end result like we sort of tried to set it up with them um, in the previous time we had last seen a a village getting sacked and raised like this sort of like a a slightly technocratic organization where they have like astrolabes and you know telescopes and they're like moving into a more of like a you know a bronze age kind right. of uh technology and so to jump from that to be be like well what if one person had access to all of that <laughs> you know and was able to control that advancement within his own confines like you know how far could he push it in a way that was like an incomprehensible super weapon to a medieval Right. town yeah and so in the medieval times anything that flies is is you know destruction yeah so, yeah very cool done well done and and you know the the animation that sequence i think it changes a little bit but i think it works because you've changed tech so yeah i mean i hope so and it it, it just was was fun to like try to make sure we were seeing like a wide range of the world like so it wasn't you know so much on the mountain and in the swamps like i really wanted to like right. expand was, the world you know blow it wide open for there was something that a little bit mobius about the the final yeah okay. oh, what yeah totally i mean like their hats and stuff i was definitely yep. thinking of like the the mobius inspired uh, did he write it the tarna section at the end of the heavy metal movie yeah right i don't think he wrote it maybe he did yeah i think he's yeah. just inspired yeah um but it's i love that i mean it, that's definitely my well, i mean i love the whole film but i i specifically love that part so trying to make it feel more like the town uh in the, in that that's another thing i forgot we were even referencing like we had a <laughs> the uh at one part they have like these sort of bolt guns at the very end and uh, i was re-watching heavy metal you know, five years into this project and i was like oh that's like that needle gun that they shoot the eunuch with and the in Tarna, anyway, oh, yeah. didn't even occur to me that it was intentional. But yeah, I mean, Moby is certainly uh, a big influence, I think, on on a lot of it. Uh, well, John Langan, anything? You're muted. It's learn to muted. use the learn to use the computer. You love. I do have something, Mike. Yes. Uh, it comes out of a conversation I was having with Laird Barron the other night about the movie. And he said, and I agree, never have I seen so much full frontal male nudity in a movie, mm. uh, animated or, you know, or, or live action. And whose decision was that? And uh, who are the models? How did you approach people about that? 
when you I were, when you were messaging the Pat question. and Oswald, were you like, listen, Pat, and <laughs> here's some things you need to know about. I, uh, you, you guys saw my tweet the other day, right? I'm watching Seinfeld with Danielle on Friday night. We're just kind of vegging out. That's kind of a great show to just turn your brain off and veg out with your wife. And lo and behold, this episode, uh, they go to a video store and it's a young Pat and Oswald uh, is the video store clerk. I'm like, that's Pat and Oswald. Yeah. Of course, Danielle's like, "Who's Pat Oswald?" Are you trying to? I, I'm not, I don't know what the what the implication of that is. Mike. Yeah, is you, the, you, yeah, you you wouldn't. you wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. No, no, I wouldn't. Was there was there full frontal male nudity in in that Seinfeld episode too? There was. Uh, there was. Uh, there could have been. It, you don't know. It's there was a counter. He might have not. Yeah, it's my it. understanding that Baron has a review coming entitled simply "Dong Fest." So I I don't awesome. know. I mean, I mean all day. Uh, I, I mean, I think we just wanted to, like, if we were going to, I mean, it always felt kind of cowardly to me that all of these other fantasy films are so, like, ready to, you know, do as much as they possibly could with breasts and that, you know, like, they were just absolutely timid of a penis. So I was like, we're good. If we're going to do nudity in this film, we're Full doing penis. all nudity. Full penis, okay. I don't remember right. there ever being a discussion about it. I mean, I'm sure there was at some point, but I'm sure the discussion was just like, there's going to be dicks and it was like oh yeah there's probably going to be a lot of dicks um hey, if that's, good. Naked, that's, one of those, that's one of those notes you were talking about and first you ignored them but then you were like hang on a second <laughs> yeah. this note yeah, in works this, in this yeah. case i was giving the notes and i was yeah. like needs more dicks <laughs> more dicks uh, right and somebody wrote yeah. back and said a lot more and you were like let's go okay <laughs> That, thank you. That answers my question. <laughs> but I do think to Morgan's point, like that, that is the, the reason behind it is like, you can't, you know, you gotta, you gotta do all of it. You gotta go all the way. <laughs> Good to know. Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> Your husband said dangle army at one point. Yeah. <laughs> He yeah, did, they yes. Do, they do have a dangle army. It's true. It's, if you're gonna true. have if you're gonna have naked slaves, it's gonna be a dangle army. Oh dear. Or as my friend Kelly Young says, sausage fest. <laughs> I'm doing everything I can to drive the ratings up, right? I want people to get in there and they're just like, hang on, yeah, sausage right. fest. We don't we don't want we don't want just men. Uh... unfortunately they're gonna confuse it with the uh, the that other movie, Sausage Fest. And I, I don't know, mm-hmm. but yeah. Mm. Both adult animation, I suppose, but very different, yeah. very different. Yeah. Uh, aren't flavors, they though? So really, in the end, aren't they just? Aren't they all about like the journey? <laughs> they're all really for kids, ultimately. <laughs> I well, think they're, just, bo- yeah, they're I, both about the triumph of the human the spirit. Human spirit. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whether it's it's with a bunch of prehistoric dongs or or uh, you know or with with condiments. What I like dogs. is that you you burst into this conversation to accuse Laird of being dick obsessed, and he's not here to to, to defend himself. Yeah, You're like, this was Laird's I, ob- I'm not observation. Saying, no, he just he was actually. I I think he is not the one who's dick obsessed, Phil July. I think you're trying to deflect, um, but that's okay. That's all right because Laird isn't here to defend himself from you or, okay, or me or, or the from body you. language. Look at the arms crossed. He's like, yeah. no, no, busted. This is not, no, yeah, busted indeed. Yeah, and what's that? Conan behind you. Okay. Anyway, yeah. indeed. <laughs> well, indeed to, to wrap up, um, it's called the Spine of Night. Uh, it's very worth your time, folks. And again, I have the link in the show notes. Uh, you can rent it on Amazon or purchase it on Amazon, and I'm sure other places like uh, what iTunes and so forth. Yeah, all the usual places. Yeah, all the usual. I thought we're on Vudu. Morgan had never heard of Vudu before. V U D U. Oh, really? if, you happen, if you happen to use it, go ahead and go ahead and rent there. Yeah, there I think go. I think Redbox has a digital rental service. We're on that. I didn't yeah. even know that existed. Yeah. Make, make Vudu feel good. Yeah. <laughs> Throw them so, a bone. Yeah, exactly. Amazon gets everything and Netflix. Uh, okay, so if, to close up, anybody want to talk about anything that they've seen? or read recently that they want to recommend to the audience? I want to ask, I haven't seen John in a long time. And John, have you joined a band? <laughs> yes, I, I, um, uh, yeah, more or less. My, okay. uh, my younger, my younger that son. That is the only excuse for your hair, right? You now. can't well, claim my, COVID uh, no, actually, this anymore. Is, this is, this was my, this was my COVID hair. And then my wife was like, you shouldn't cut that. And I was like, okay. Wow, my um, wife says the opposite. And then uh, your, your wife says your wife that. still likes you, Mike. Yeah, that's true. No, my damn it, Kelly. And 
And then in the well, meantime, you'll think of a comeback late tonight. Uh, oh, I know it. Uh, L'Esprit d'Escalier. Yeah. No. And then my younger <laughs> son was in a um, like a school of rock kind of thing. And he graduated from it uh, to go to college. And they have an adult program. And I was like, OK, uh, so I spent the weekend. Yeah. Playing a bunch of rock and roll songs at a local restaurant and club. I uh, hope there's Friday video that will be night. uploaded. Sadly, there's a lot of video apparently. Video or it didn't happen. There's, there were people dressed in Chewbacca outfits. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, Langan was a headbanger. He was like that, that hair was not. just going everywhere. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, there were people. There were people in drag. There, he there probably injured dresses. people with that hair. Um, there was dancing too close. We, uh, yeah, it was crazy. It was really, really crazy. And some of my colleagues from work came to make it even better. So. As did my mom. My 84-year-old mother sat there and watched uh, a bunch of, of middle-aged people do the Beastie Boys sabotage. That's amazing. It was. Uh, it was actually. It wasn't really amazing. For, I was not on it because I'm not that. That you know. But uh, yeah, she watched that. I'd, I'd like to ask Mike. Um, yes. Hey, you know. Let's keep this going. I haven't seen you guys in forever. Well, we got to shut this down already. I want to talk to. No, all we don't have to do various anything. things. You guys have nothing better to do. It's Sunday night. We'll that give is some true. Topics. That is true. I saw okay, Eternals. So let's talk about. Uh, I have not seen it yet. Be quiet. Which one? Eternals. Eternals. Everyone oh, shut I up. I seen that. But That's in theaters. I'm not going to go see that. I heard it was terrible. I've seen The Deep House. Yes. I've, true. I've seen The Deep House. I've uh, seen recommend it. Recommend yay or nay. It's okay. For me, it's a nice concept. It's different. Um, but when you get right down to it, it's, you know, it's a haunted house underwater. And I, I do think it's worth a watch. Okay. It's not a bad movie at all. I don't think it's a great movie. So, but, but, but should you watch it once? Yeah, sure. It was an enjoyable watching experience, but I have some beefs with some things about it. I don't know how much you want to go into it or not. Was it the acting? I could see well, anybody <laughs> having a beef about the acting. That was that was part of it. Um, there was this thing in the beginning where she's practicing holding her breath underwater. And of course, we're thinking, OK, foreshadowing. Hmm, I wonder where this is going to come in. Um, but it was also that she lied about how long she held her breath underwater. And I don't know if it's her boyfriend or her husband. I still don't know pestering her like well how long did you hold your breath underwater and she's like lying about it and then it just kind of seemed like oh woman not know how to do thing has to impress man that she practiced thing and then we can go into the lake to do thing and it was just for no real he was, reason he was being a bit of a control freak i'm the boss the entire film wasn't he kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah and it was yeah. painting, painting her as like oh i'm so scared you know don't go you know I you know, felt like it, it was used more to paint him as a prick than her to be weak in any way. She was just. Yeah. And I can see that. I did she like the fact that their relationship was not painted in a great light. I totally. No. Yeah. I think that was great because that's how relationships are. They're not perfect. You know, everybody's. There complex. was a Lovecraft red herring at the beginning and nothing came of it. So I was not happy about that. Very but. true. I, I kind of loved it just because, you know, what a gimmick. I mean, if you're going to make a gimmick movie, this is a pretty great gimmick. Oh, I don't and, disagree. And there were some uh, there were some scenes, even with the bad acting and everything, there were some scenes that raised the hair on my arms. I right, like, but you yeah. were alone. That happened in a movie? You were alone watching it in the dark, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you had your wife talking to you and going, this isn't scary. Uh, she's not here this weekend, but my son was here, so you know. he was not impressed. He didn't see the movie. He was well, in, he was so in the other room. alone in the dark, also, and pretty nothing? much. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I how do I say this? I'm a lot braver than you are. Um, so oh, oh. no, I will grant you. Uh, okay, joking aside, though, really, yeah, those the, the, what you're talking about. Those were some very creepy scenes. And there was definitely, I was thinking that if during the movie, that if Danielle was with me, that there were quite a few scenes that she would have jumped and screamed at. So, uh, oh. I, again, I think it was, 
I think definitely think this movie is worth a watch. Sorry, Bridget, what? No, I was going to say I liked those scenes where there was kind of alternate realities, like different characters were in what could be considered a different space or a different reality at the same yeah. time. That was really cool. Yeah. Or the thoughts of um, where are they seeing something because they're going mad and like, I don't want to spoil it, but the whole scene with the chains and the red water, let's say, where it's like, what is really happening? Is she just going crazy? Is she being pulled into a madness? Is it a different reality? That Those kind of scenes were, were really cool. I would so, like to ask, go ahead, Kelly, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just going to say, Bridget, you, you kind of enjoyed it or you hated it or? <laughs> I, I thought that cinematically it was awesome. I thought as just a scary underwater haunted house movie, it was good. There were just some narrative things that I, that kind of killed it for me. Um, they set it up this big thing about them being in France, but narratively that had really no reason the whole the whole story with the like and I, I hope this isn't a spoiler but like the oh missing kids from the village really I didn't need that there was over exposition in some areas I would have rather not known about that I would have rather just known that it was some kind of creepy occult thing oh and another beef that killed it for me oh that's a pentagram that's satanic okay one thing it's not a pentagram and secondly yeah. like it would have been much cooler to just be like, wow, what's that sigil? You know, why did you have to even go there? Because you just kind of totally ruined it. Whereas it was some kind of weird sort of Lovecraftian sort of not sig sigil, which would have been scary enough on its own. So I think in some areas like that, it was just trying too hard. Man, this is a tough crowd. She the whole <laughs> movie underwater. And then you guys are just like, as far as underwater haunted houses go. <laughs> <laughs> no, that part was Wanda? really cool. That was the first time I'd ever seen it. I, I well, you know, the, you, you do have the added um, suspense, I guess, uh, that they have an hour's worth of air. That's right. all they have. So they have 60 minutes. So it's not like your normal haunted house where you can breathe if you're trapped you know, you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to run out of air or anything like that. You know, that's an, that's an added problem, which yes. added to the suspense of the movie. That's the, the ticking time bomb, yeah. Right, yes. exactly. Uh, has anyone seen a movie called I Am Lisa? It looks interesting, uh, especially if you're into werewolf movies, uh, which I am, if they're done right. A uh, sadistic small-town sheriff and her underlings uh, this is a 2020 movie, so it's fairly recent. A sadistic small town sheriff and her underlings brutalize Lisa and leave her for dead in the woods. Bitten by a werewolf and bestowed with supernatural abilities, Lisa tries to retain her humanity as she exacts revenge. 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. Hmm. And 4 out of 10 on IMDb. So Streaming? Do, with, do with that uh, what you will. It is streaming. Um, looks like you can watch it on Amazon Prime. I don't know if that means you have to rent it or not. Let me see. No, it's on Prime. You, you don't have to rent it. You can just watch it. So, yeah, I am Lisa. Um, it Did looks like good. It or you? Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I was wondering. I'm trying to decide whether I watch it or not. Of course, it being on Prime and not have to pay anything, that makes it easy, an easier decision also i've i've heard about this movie called the wind for like nine or ten months now and i'm like i don't like westerns i don't want to watch this yeah i've avoided that too but i keep hearing that it's just really really good and i, I liked it. It, it it the 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 plot well the synopsis i should say i haven't watched it yet synopsis kind of reminds me a little bit of uh uh, what's that winter movie with Ron Perlman? Um, uh, yeah, Last Winter? Know. The Last Winter, thank you. Kind of The synopsis reminds me of that where the land is actually um, there's some kind of force to the land. Of course, I haven't seen the movie. we totally off, but that's what the synopsis seems to be saying. Also reminds me of, you know, 
what Laird talks about sometimes when he's in, in situations where he's been isolated that, you know, hey, the land doesn't want, really want you here, that type of feeling. So I'm probably going to watch it, even though it's a Western. Yeah, I liked it. Um, it's, oh, you uh, saw it. Okay. I did. Yeah. It's, it's uh, like, it, I mean, nothing is ever as weird as I want it to be. So, like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, so it, you know, I think it ends up hewing a little, a little towards the familiar, but like, it's a good setting and it's a lot of, like, you know, the sound design's good. There's a, it's a small cast in a single location. So it doesn't really feel like a, a Western as much as just people in a cabin. But. As much as just isolation. Yeah. Okay. I, I thought it was good. That's fair. All right. Well, I think I, I will watch it then. Uh, anything else anybody wants to recommend? Uh, I was recommended The Wailing. I, I don't I, remember who. I love that movie. That's a, I'm a big Oh, yeah. Movie. The Wailing's great. 99% on Rotten Tomatoes. I've watched that twice and I still can't figure it out. <laughs> All right. I'm going to have think, to watch it. I think that's the point. I've got a. I, this is a whole other conversation. I could talk about The Wailing <laughs> for an hour about like <laughs> what, what they're getting at. Morgan, but, Morgan though, you... nobody has any place else to be. <laughs> Morgan, I actually, the, I actually do have a thing I got to run to. But. Don't they have a new? Uh, haven't they done a new film? Uh, but I haven't seen that. Does anybody know? Uh, uh, I can't... Phil and I watched that. It's the the medium. Is is the? It's not the director, but it's the producers of the Wailing. Oh, okay. That. All right. We we saw it at um, Telluride, and it that one was. It very much felt like from the producers of the Wailing a more uh, commercially viable film. <laughs> Okay. So like it it's a lot more like sort of uh, you know it's 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 similar like setting and sort of characters but a lot more sort of standard um you know Japanese horror stuff. You know, oh, it's right. a lot right. it's a lot more um traditional more lucid it, than the whaling. Yeah, yeah. I mean it, it it definitely had a lot more like people jumping in their seats than I think the whaling would have outside of that one scene. So yeah, but it, I, it, I had fun with it. I think it's on Shutter. How would you say it compares to uh, something like the Ninth Gate? Don't, don't you <laughs> well, dare! I mean, it's a high. I, I'm a little softer on the Ninth Gate. Watch it. I I like it, but I don't. Uh, I don't have a. I don't have a like horse in this more race. Like the Eighth Gate is it like the Eighth Gate or the Tenth Gate. Like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> I mean, it, the movie seemed to have run out of money and interest by the finale, so I, I don't know if they got to all nine gates. But... So just just like the Ninth Gate, okay? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. What so. about? Um, has anybody seen? Nobody gets out alive. No one gets out alive. Uh, isn't that so. Nathan's? Yeah. No, it's Nathan's. Adam Adam Neville. Adam, Neville. Adam, Adam Neville. Neville. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I have not seen it yet. Kelly's drinking, so that means he's seen it and he didn't like it. That's and amazing how you can read that it. The reveal of the creature is pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will sit if Adam Neville and this producer slash director do a whole bunch of these, I'll sit through whatever you want just to show me these great creatures. Yeah. All right. I'm adding it to my list right now. But I think the story was actually pretty damn good. I didn't read the book. So I don't know how true it is. I, I found myself, uh, you know, doing my laundry and checking my phone through the movie. There's a movie that I want to ask about. If any of you have seen it and tells, can tell me if it's worth the, uh, the time or not. Uh, it's called Broadcast. It's a 2021 movie, Broadcast Signal Intrusion. I, that just popped up in my list, mm -hmm. and I have not bit the bullet yet. In the late 1990s, a video archivist unearths a series of sinister pirate broadcasts and becomes obsessed with uncovering the conspiracy behind them. You know, first of all, I love the, the, the time yeah. setting because the first, the you don't have to deal with all the... Huh? I've seen this film. It's called Video Drop. <laughs> <laughs> is this I, is this good? I don't know. No, yeah. I'm saying it's like just based on that description, that's Video Drum. Oh, I saw it. It's it's no Video Drum. But, <laughs> oh. it, but I I Phil and I have been at these fet. You know, we because the movie was in festivals all year. We've gotten like the streaming version of every festival all year. So I've seen a, at some point this year, we've seen everything, I feel like. But I like that, that more than the people I talk to 
about it. I thought the first one of those people was really <laughs> mysterious and really cool. And then when it has to, and then it ends up like trying to land the narrative into something comprehensible instead of being like, like, I think I, we both probably wanted it to feel more like a, a Kiyoshi Kurosawa film. Nothing, like Kira, nothing's, or something. nothing's ever as weird as either of us wants it to be, I think, is ultimately but, the, the, the I problem. problem too, but, yeah. but, but the first part was a lot of, like, just great VHS texture and a lot of just, um, I don't know, it's moody and it's weird. But then when they have to, like, tie it all up. I, it, it, uh, you know, in, in, and I'm nostalgic for that kind of stuff, too, you know? Yeah. So. So, I, so I'd say watch the first half <laughs> or, or, or watch the first half for sure. <laughs> but then, you know, like it's not, I don't want to, you know, it, I just always want, nothing would ever get made if it was as ambient and hazy as I, I wish every film was. And then there's one more I wanted to ask about um, that I haven't seen. Uh, the Eighth Night. Yeah, I've yeah. avoided too. Not even heard of this one. I don't know if this is my kind of thing. This is definitely Pete's kind of thing. With prayer reeds in one hand and an axe in the other, a monk hunks down a monk hunts down a millennia old spirit that's possessing humans and unleashing hell on earth. First of all, why is that a Pete thing? That is because like you, <laughs> because you watch bad movies. And this is bad. that that sentence should have been changed so that you don't have monk hunts in the same line yeah yeah that is a a, bad way well at first i said monk hunk you know so but are we gonna hear time is on my side that's the real question yes it is (laughs) i love that movie i watched it like recently like a year ago i rewatched it oh good yeah anybody else want to throw anything out there that i should add to my list so I will throw something out there that um, I, I never hear anybody talk about. I just watched it. Michael DeBronzo, if you're listening, you're going to hear me talk about this on Strange Eons Radio. Oh, DeBronzo is always listening. Always. This is called... Even when we're not doing the show, he's listening. <laughs> this is from 1973. That's creepy. <laughs> and it is called Nothing But the Night with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Anybody? Nothing But the Night. It was, <laughs> it was the only film that was made by Christopher Lee's film company. 1973. Yeah. That's certainly got that's certainly got bad reviews. Yeah, but uh, what are you going to do? Listen to bad reviews about a Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing movie? Did you like it? I loved it, and and not just because it has uh, a lot of the same themes of the thing on the doorstep. Right. Okay. How have so, I not seen this? I'll okay. add it. Yeah, it's, it's available to rent on Prime. Uh, it's not streaming free or anything like that. I really enjoyed it. It's got a little full quarter in it. It's got a lot of uh, the thing on the doorstep on it. And it's got Christopher Lee with a big fucking mustache from 73. What we should do now is is calibrate everyone on the movie thing. And we'll calibrate with the following film. It Follows. Where do you stand on It Follows? Great film. Love it. You can you can stay. You can stay. Yeah, yeah. Really, really <laughs> liked it a lot. I I haven't gone back to watch it. Uh, I've been curious to, but I was a big fan of it when I saw it. I think it. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, sort of just stop at it's a ghost STD and don't really follow the themes further. But I think it's a lot more it's, about like death yeah. consciousness yeah, as and, a, and as the a right ev- inevitability message. of something. You know, the last lines in the film she's reading from, I forget who, you know, uh, and uh, not only that, but Bridget, the uh, music is so superb in that movie. Yeah. It really adds to the film. It, it's just done so well. Um, Bridget, this has to show up on your Facebook music page. Why I guess so. I Well, now that you called me out, I actually haven't watched it. <laughs> What? You haven't oh, watched you're gonna, it. You're gonna love well, that. I, 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 okay, I listen. I, wait, 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 wait. I, 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 I haven't watched me. Okay, you, there, you should watch sure. it, guys. You should watch it. Well, okay. Let me caveat that. <laughs> I had a teenager. I was a mom of a teenager at the time when it came out. I just didn't want to watch that subject at the time. <laughs> but oh, I will the, watch the it now. Yes. What, now that now that it's too late, you'll watch it. Sure. I, I am. He's on uh, his own now. No, all I'm kidding, kidding aside, I am 
very interested in your thoughts on the, the worst possible sa- movie I've ever seen. On, on the soundtrack. The Ninth Gate. Fair. Because, uh, you know, I'm not as trained as you musically, but I am, I've had some training and I, I noticed these things. It just, it, it's just so perfect. I, I really can't. All right. Challenge accepted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch it too. Oh, thanks, Rick. <laughs> All right. Maybe me, you, and Bryn Mark should uh, do like we did last. What movie did oh, we yeah, watch that'd be last fun. time? Science. That'd All be right, cool. Science. So I call up. That. I call up Bridget and, and her husband. His name's Mike too, so you know he's a good guy. Um, <laughs> call up Bridget and Mike one night. I'm like, I don't know. I'm in the mood to watch Signs. You guys want to watch Signs? And Bridget's like, What? How do we do that? You know, or something oh, like I that. Did. <laughs> did you said something like that? No, I was like, I was like, oh, cool. How do you want to watch it? <laughs> oh yeah, All right. I'm like, we just both rent the movie. And we hit play at the exact same time, and then we uh, like we we stay on the uh, uh, what were we on Facebook Messenger, Messenger yeah, chatting to each other, yeah. So that was yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. So, has anybody seen a film called Scream and Scream Again? Yes, yes. right. Mm-mm. Meet surprise, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Yeah. Dang. Even, yeah, even though All Peter three Cushing, of them? Peter, Peter Cushing, we need to have a marathon. Jesus, oh, hold it one minute. Peter Cushing's role. It's like two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but he's still in there. <laughs> we, 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 Lee and Vincent Price do a, a limited screen time and they spread it out. So it seems they have a bigger role than they, like they actually had in screen right. time. I, I watched about 30 minutes of it and I was like, this is really, really bad. Oh. Is it? <laughs> I liked it. I, I liked it too. I don't love I, it, but I like it. Okay. It's it's got some weird. They, they made it a Dr. Mabuse film in Germany. Yeah. All right. I'll, tra- I'll, I'll try and finish it. But hey, at least the, I just the, think the, the police yeah. inspector is the best character in the movie. Okay. okay. Uh, I can get my brother to watch. I'm not a serial killer. <laughs> I haven't oh, seen I that one yet too. on Netflix. And that, oh, I like that. that. Was, he really enjoyed it because I love that movie. Yeah. Hmm. Were you Were you going to ask me something, Kelly? Yeah, I was going to say, it's so nice when you have filmmakers on and they uh, yeah. they've got their camera set up so nicely and everything. And then you got Langan on, who's a writer, and clearly has never used the camera in any possible <laughs> yeah, way. We, yeah, like, we got to like see, a, this see from the nose up. And then all of this above his head. That's nice. We can't see that glorious hair as well as we should be listen, able to. Listen, Kelly, all right? I know you like the Ninth Gate, all right? But I let's love just the Ninth Gate. Yeah, I, I knew it. Yeah, so let's just leave that. Okay. The know. ultimate insult. You like the ninth gate, don't you? <laughs> exactly. You're a you big worm. Gate. <laughs> Phil, in the meantime, is spinning around in his chair, blood All right. pouring out of his head. I've got <laughs> one for you. There's right. something I've really, really enjoyed. I've watched it three times. Oh, God. The new Muppet version of Haunted Mansion. Yes. Well, actually, I'm with I you. Loved that. It. I loved it. I think that. that's just fun as all hell. I, I've been thinking of watching that. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I uh, I'm real um, nostalgic when it comes to the Muppets. You know, I just my love Gonzo. Me so. too. So, what what's the Muppet movie that starts off? It's the is the space one where he starts off where the whole house is singing. It's a brick. She's a brick house. You know. No, no, nobody. Okay, never mind. I'm the only nerd. I think that's the space one. I think that's. I think that's the space one. Yeah, Muppets from space. Right. Exactly. Thank you. I'm putting Muppets Haunted Mansion on my watch list. Damn it! Right now. Is that one Waldorf in the the Muppet Haunted Mansion? Yes. Yes, yes. they are. Sort of. Um. uh, You know, I just think that. To go back to it follows for just a second. It it just it's that mounting dread that that, that movie is so good at. Um. It, it, yeah, I think it's just very well done. And I I think that. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want this to come out the wrong way, but you you have to have some imagination to be creeped out by this movie. You know, otherwise you're just oh, it's a ghost following somebody what's scary about that you know but there there are deeper things at work here no you're wrong okay 
I'm wrong. I can, I can accept that. All right, my last question is VHS 2. Because I heard VHS, the first one was not good, but I saw Laird tweeted about VHS 2 and said it was really good. Some mm. of that effect. The, I the, like all of them. There's one sequence in, I mean, VHS 2 is better than the first one. There's one sequence in VHS 2 oh, that's, yeah. that's absolutely knock down, drag out, incredible. Uh, yeah, the and the rest Timo are... Tejano? Yeah. And the rest of them are pretty good. Incredible, yeah. wow. Uh, you should just see it. I don't, I don't want to... Yeah. Just, okay. just, okay. just, just see it. It's all worth right. the price of entry just for yep. that yep. segment. Yeah. I'd go as far as to say there's like one segment in all of the VH movies that are pretty good. Yeah. So you, you kind of have to like go on Wikipedia or something and figure out where you should fast forward to. <laughs> the third well, one's the only one I think is mostly skippable okay. outside of the, the one skateboarding. I, in the... I heard out of the three that the second one was the best. That's what I heard. Anyway. Didn't they just release a new one? Yeah, yeah there's a good yeah, yeah. VHS 94 or something mm-hmm. like that. It, it, I thought it was really good, yeah. uh, frankly. I, I liked every bit of that. Um, last thing I say is if, if anyone out there that has not seen the Devil's Backbone, uh, Del Toro, you, you should. Why, why um, is this coming up? It's great. Yeah. Huh? Why is this coming up all of a sudden? It's on my list of movies to watch. I'm, I, I'm gonna Spine of it Night, it Devil's Backbone. Years. Mm-hmm. Is that? I mean, is that? Is that? Is it that complicated? You know. <laughs> Wait, did Del what, Toro? Did I have to write it down? Twenty to plug the movie. Is there a new edition coming out or something? Mm, no, I don't know, Del Toro. I, I love the movie. I just thought it was an odd one to throw out right now. It, I only did it because it's. I'm looking at my list of movies that I'm thinking about watching, and it was sitting there. So. I'm going to keep you on here, all of you, all of you. I love you. You're my Brady Bunch family right now, and. I'm going to keep you on here and make Mike say and the last thing over and over until you guys are finally like, oh, fuck. All right. It's the last thing. I'm having such a good time. I miss all of you. Very oh, I miss you too. You. Mike will never invite me on. So that's oh my such God. bullshit. Let's had an open invitation. You know. Listen, you left us, Dad. Don't try to come back now, okay? <laughs> Just hey, look, look your decision. Listen, okay? Mister, go out for a pack of cigarettes and never of, come yeah, back. There was oh a lot God. of crying, okay? But we that dealt with crazy. it. We're stronger now. We're better without you. And okay? now you're here reopening old wounds. That's right. Can yeah. You, no. 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 You, you had to your me chance. like the Springsteen song. You had your chance. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Will you take your hungry <laughs> heart out to dinner elsewhere? When I okay? see it's night on a downtown train. Hey, Kelly, seriously, yeah. though, Kelly, is yeah. this the first time we've seen each other since the film festival? Since Portland. Yeah. Yeah. Did we go out drinking like three nights in a row and I didn't get home until like dawn? I don't Sounds think we about stopped right. drinking. I wouldn't call it three nights in a row. I would call it all weekend because there were times we just split off at 1 p.m. and started drinking again. Yeah. Look, it's just it's so everybody listening knows, don't listen to Young. He's He knows he's got an open invitation to be here anytime he wants. First I've seen of this. And I and I do <laughs> I do miss him. Now, let's see if I'm... Oh, okay. With the viewers... In this Brady Bunch thing, Kelly is above me, so I'll just go boom, boom, boom like that. <laughs> you know, hit him a few times. So, yeah. Uh, did anybody here see Antlers? That's the way we became the easy no, bunch. Yes. The yes. easy yep. bunch. You saw Antlers? Was it good? Was it yes. worth the interminable wait? Um, that- yes and no. <laughs> um- oh God. <laughs> so that means no. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's essentially two movies, right? It's a drama about a dying town and um, all of the authorities, whether it's teachers, law enforcement, administrators, they seem to just have zero power to get anything done. And then you've got the monster part. Both of, both of those aspects came off really well. It's just putting it together, I thought was kind of an odd, odd mix. Well, hopefully sometime soon it'll be on video on demand uh, so so mike does that mean that since this movie's out we can change the name yeah of... yeah i think it does i was just gonna ask. i was gonna bring that up too <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah we need to change it to we'll probably change it to it follows until bridget sees it <laughs> <laughs> 
everybody, I'm, I, uh, I hate to have to dip out, but I, t- no, I no, no, have please. a thing uh, I got to run to. We're, we're going to be on soon anyway, too. So. Wait a second. Uh, no, we're not. Uh, I have a question. Great to see no, you, Morgan. I, I know where this is going. I, this has been an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much for having me on here. Just a, oh, what an absolute you. treat to talk to so many learned individuals. Uh, Who's um, that? We're not oh, learned. you mean Rick. Oh, you yeah. Mean Rick. Yeah. yeah okay. just watch so. a lot of um, But this has been <laughs> an absolute pleasure, and... Uh, Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Morgan. Congra- so cool congratulations to meet you, Morgan. Phone, buddy. So cool to meet you too. Thank you very much. See ya. Thank you, Morgan. See ya. Bye bye. So now I have a question for Philip. Then mm-hmm. uh, I'll go back. Hey, if you've stuck through the the podcast this long, we're going to go back to Spine of Night. <laughs> uh, the next thing that you do does it have to be animated? Does it have to be animated? No. Well, I'm just, uh, you guys were talking about, oh, there's other things we'd like to do. In oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you are a filmmaker, and I've seen your other films. So yeah. is there something on the horizon that is not animated? Um, For me, not at the moment. Every I've sort of um, just become an uh, animation guy, but I would like to do more live action. I just don't have anything at the moment that's uh, that I that I know that will be live action. Um, and would there be full frontal nudity, male nudity? In it? There, that's, that that's Langan good. wants to know. I, I want to know. Inquiring I mean, minds want to know. The would last it be time dongle army. <laughs> the last time I made a live action film, there was full frontal male nudity dongle in it. Army. So I can only I've set a precedent at this point. So so we it just. I forgot That's about that. It. And William Jackson Harper is yeah. is just that follows him that scene, so yeah. to speak. There we go with it yep. follows. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Where's the Seinfeld base? You're bringing it back around. But I just want to say, Phil, uh, my 12 year old self would have been much more disappointed in Spine of Night than I was. And I, I loved Spine of Night. I love it. I remember 12 years old sneaking down on HBO to watch heavy metal in 1982. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so I, and, and as Bridget said, this was a whole di- that vibe brought me right back there. In, in fact, when I ordered some food, I turned down some Dodd Felder <laughs> heavy metal right. as I was eating my burger. Then I went back and then I realized, you know what? There's nudity and, and violence, but it is not, there's none of that kind of sexuality that you had in say the first one and all the magazines or like a Boris Vallejo yeah. kind of painting, right? So this had a whole different vibe. My 12 year old self would have probably been a little bit more upset but the well, if you turn upset. off the volume if you turn down the volume to zero and just put on subtitles and play uh the dark side of the moon while the movie is going <laughs> then uh you're gonna learn some things man so you really do like the ninth gate don't you i do I, re- I i really do i have, I have, I that, have book. that i have that book too i have yeah, it I have too I might even be within arm's reach no it's not in here no i don't have it in here oh wow look at that that. you son of a bitch (laughs) that is cool whose signature is that that's cool i only have the ebook yeah i have the ebook that's a great book i wonder if you signed my ebook and the flanders panel is another one that he wrote that was really good as well but philip before you were directing you were writing um, you don't have scripts out there that might just be picked up by somebody else or um I have scripts out there. They might be. I mean, you never you never know. Uh I mean at this point, like because I do that that I write that Love Death and Robot show on Netflix too. So that's all animated. That's also an adult animated TV show that I coincidentally was hired to work on after I had already started Spine of Night, because there was such a long time, as we talked about, in making Spine of Night. So in the middle of it. I was hired to write that show. Um, so at, the, at, at this specific time, like I, there's going to be another season of that. So I'm working on that. And I have another animated show um, that I'm supposed to be, well, that I'm currently writing for another um, streamer. And uh, so, yeah, it's just at this point, it's like animation. And then I've also done video game writing. So I do a lot of um, uh, I'm working with a Swedish company on a video game company or video game that they've been working on also for almost as long as spine of night. Like I've been working on that video game. It will be longer than spine of night. That, that video game process. I probably started it. Uh, at this point, f- four years ago, five years ago. And I think that they won't be done for another three years. It's just, it takes forever. So um, yeah, I mean, uh, at some point I will do something that is, that is live action, but at this point it's all drawings and computers. 
<laughs> which is which is fine you know it's all right yeah cool yeah all right so yeah no it follows no, <laughs> no yeah. he's not ready to be I'll, done I'll, I'll continue asking questions if i'm the only <laughs> last if i'm the last one here I was, I, are you I growing a beard are you wait growing, it's 8 30 oh my god it's 8 20 i gotta go <laughs> you got things i have to do what do you yeah. have to do pete i oh my god i have all these great i have these two great ideas that i have to write down and if we go offline i'll tell you about them cool but <laughs> We do a Patreon at a certain level, you could go offline with us, right, Mike? Yeah, uh, we'll try and figure that out. Yeah. Can I, can, can I plug some books? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Finally, Kenneth Heights, to the Lovecraft. Is what? Me. Oh my God, it's a miracle. I got that it. Is, yet, I got it yesterday. That oh. is like one of the signs of the apocalypse, isn't it? Car Carpenter's not here, or he'd be bitching about this. He hasn't got his yet. I would. I was thinking about this too, and then I and then I opened it and looked at it, and I was like, "This is really lovely." So I was happy two, about that. Two volumes: the destination and the tales. Is it three years lovely? <sighs> it's at least three years lovely. That's you, that's five. that's a head scratcher. Why it would take three years? I mean, I don't know. I've never published a book that took that long. Look, yeah. I I am supposed to be receiving signature sheets for a book that came out three years ago so i'm sure that i'm sure they're in your mailbox right now there's john how hard would it be to just tip your camera just a little lower you're not looking at us or interacting but i'd and, like and to see maybe get some face. light I no, no, it's a whole aesthetic it's great i love it it, it shouldn't be any different than it you're is. Like, no, it's, it's like you remember Parasite when you see the, the eyes at the top of the stairs, you see the head just at the top of the stairs. That's me. I see Kilroy the ghost. here with you. I'm the ghost that's haunting this podcast. He's and therefore really... making, it, making it lucky. Yeah, I'm actually I'm bringing great fortune to all of you. I can't even figure out the room that you're in. Like, I don't even understand what's behind you. It's, yeah, no, that's, we've seen that room. We've seen that room in full light, and we still don't know what it is. Can you show a little pride in yourself and show your whole face? Hi. No, no, no I'm just, you. Yeah. All right, sorry. So much shade. My bad, <laughs> Kelly. I'm still waiting for you to sign this. Oh, look at that! Wow, oh, one of, I have one of those. 99 copies. <laughs> 99 problems. One. <laughs> i've got one of those those are, that's cool yeah 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 that was the I whole like idea it. of strange eons getting into to publishing was to do something with uh with pictures and different textures on the paper and stuff like that so scratch and sniff scratch and sniff for sure all right we talked about movies what books are people reading i am reading new maps of dream and I just sent you a book review. You did? Yeah. Oh, how are you liking that? I'm, I'm enjoying this quite a bit, Pete. And I've told you what I what really want for, from you is to stop doing shit like this. But I'm really enjoying this. I <laughs> What's that title it? for those who are listening later? It is the Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club. I think Pete is a really good writer who probably should stop writing about Lovecraftian stuff and write his own stuff. Uh, but I am really loving this. All right. So here's the deal, Kelly. I promised to finish the narrative that I've started. And that's at least two more books after the one that comes out this summer. The problem is you then alluded to uh, in your narrative the heat death of the universe, so you could just continue doing this forever. And yes. I think that I think that you're a, a writer that needs to break free of Lovecraft and write your own stuff. I'm really enjoying your writing in this. And uh, the one thing that I really like about the story that Pete, you know, sent to me was that it was not overtly Lovecraftian, um, I, which was you know takes a lot of work to find that fine line between obviously inspired by Lovecraft, but not doing what he did. Yes. And I worked very hard, you know, to, and hopefully someday we'll see that story. Oh, here's a bit of news. 
that I almost forgot. Mike's not interested in what you have to say, Pete. Oh no, he was done. Um... <laughs> <laughs> also, John gets lower and lower. Now I can only see his glasses and only half of them. John, yes. you don't have to sit at the kitty table. I told you. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reframe so I can be like John. Ready? I've got a desk. Go <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> here, here we go. Here we go. Uh, yeah. Anyway. I'm horrified that Philip is the big name on the podcast and he won't talk that much. <laughs> Laird Baron, um, his uh, Imago sequence. Am I saying that right? What is that? <laughs> Langan <laughs> tribute art. Fan art. You saw it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. You're welcome. Bridget. I'm going to make that. Nice. Send me a copy of that, and I'm going to make it my profile picture. <laughs> yeah. that. Bridget, we should have signed that. An NFT. It'll be the first <laughs> NFT. Oh, right. God. You're going to be a millionaire. Uh, Laird Barron's the Imago sequence. Is that right, John? Yes, Imago. Imago like, sequence. Like, I am Imago Montoya. You killed my father. Oh, my Prepare God. To, to die. No, but uh, to be transubstantiated into some unholy, unimaginable beast. I think with most uh, Audible memberships, um, that Audible book is free through December 4th to read, to listen yeah, to. Yeah, I will listen to that a long time ago, and now it's free. I see how it is. Yeah. Yeah. How Laird does it? <laughs> I, don't think he, I, don't, I don't think he's in charge of that. <laughs> oh, Laird's in charge of everything. Is he? Why do you think Phil likes, why do you think he likes the Ninth Gate? Come on, Phil's got more taste than that, but Laird was like, listen, Gillette, the Ninth Gate. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that Laird and I have ever discussed the Ninth Gate. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he just, he didn't even discuss it. He was just like, you're going to watch this and you're going to like it. And Phil was like, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to. I like other things. I like Herbie the Love Bug. And Laird was like, you know, come on, Gillette, get on the, get on the train, get on the Laird train. Hey, Horton Hears a Who is a cosmic horror story, if I ever read one, you know? Uh, so anyway, yeah, the Imago sequence, you can listen for free with most Audible memberships until December the 4th. Speaking so there's of, your public later, service I, announcement. I read a book um, by Fred Venturini recently. It's called um, To Dust You Shall Return. And it's about a, a kind of a, a Chicago mob enforcer whose spouse is killed. Um, and he has to get revenge, only she's killed by a cult from her past. She comes from a small town in Illinois, and he's oh no kidding. He's got to take out a hit basically on a supernatural guy called the mayor <laughs> of that town. And it's it's really brutal, but it's really good. I just thought about <laughs> Laird, you know. I love the way I love the way you're you're, you're, you're laughing at this, Rich. You're like, it's horrifying, and you're just chuckling horrifying. away. It's <laughs> chortling, you know. You're just like he does things that, that no sane human being should do to another human being. What, what's Define the name of it again? Compassion. It's called uh, To Dust You Shall Return, I believe. To Dust You Shall Return, okay. By Fred Venturini. To Dust You Shall Return. Yep. <clears throat> I might have to check that out. There we go. To Dust You Shall Return. Oh, it's giving me Bible verses. Why has the run go? What? What? Where did Kelly go? Oh, there he is. You don't have to be like John. You don't. Right. <laughs> oh, no. I'm horrified. What Pure is going pressure. on with John? <laughs> so, Kelly, you ready? I'll tell yeah. you the novel that I will never write. Is what the hell? Is that Godzilla coming up? Is that no, German Godzilla? Are you pausing for dramatic effect or what? Well, John has got. I know I'm being distracted by whatever John Langan is. Hurdle with the hat? Oh no, <laughs> the hat moves. I'm horrified. And Kelly's got Ray That's Dean. Amazing. Is that Ray Dean? <laughs> the uh, samurai warriors in the back there. Rich, I've got them all. Oh, I loved those as a kid. I had every one. That's the horror of my life is, is trying to buy back everything I had as a kid at only four or five times the price. <laughs> Tell me oh, you have a Stretch Armstrong gosh. somewhere okay. back there. <laughs> yeah, this looks good, Rich. Right. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Yeah. All right. Well, I do have to go. Sorry, Kelly.
No, that's fine. You can go. I'll keep this up. Hey, welcome to Strange Eons Radio. That's Rich over there. <laughs> that's Phil over there. That's Rick over there. That's Bridget over there. That's Pete over there. That's John down there. Thank you to all my patrons. Keep sending me the money and not Kelly. Uh, appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see you next week. I forget who's going to be on, but somebody will be. I guarantee you. We'll, we'll definitely be here. So. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody.